<coughs> hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Talking Baseball on this Sunday morning as we get ready for Game 3 between the Giants and the Tampa Bay Rays. And the Giants put it together yesterday, and we talked on the show about the Giants' lack of hitting home runs. Well, yesterday they hit five, and that's the way baseball works. Uh, you never know what's going to happen from day to day, but a good game for the Giants yesterday. They wrap up this three-game series today with Tampa Bay, and then it's off to Miami to take on the Marlins, and the Marlins actually won a home game. They beat Atlanta yesterday, so the Marlins finally uh, win a game at home. They're one and eight, and the Giants go in there on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Then it's back home against the Arizona Diamondbacks for the weekend. That's going to be a heck of a good series. And uh, then the Mets come in. This is this is baseball, and it is a time of year where you know in April, you kind of figure out who you are. And April and May, you figure out who you are. In June, you kind of fine tune it. And then July, you add what you need. And then it's August and September. It's the race to the finish. So we're in an appropriate time of baseball. And that is kind of figuring out who's who uh, for the San Francisco Giants. So they win yesterday 11-2, to 11 runs, 13 hits. Uh, Tampa Bay, two runs and eight hits. This Tampa Bay team, and I said it yesterday, the Giants are getting them at the right time. Uh, and we talked about the problem with Tampa Bay. Their Wander Franco has got the uh, issues in the Dominican Republic and probably will not play again. And that's a major part of their lineup that's out. And um, what, Nathaniel Lowe or Lau, whoever he is, uh, whatever he's calling himself these days, he's out as well. And really, once you get past Yandy Diaz and a Rosarena, you kind of have uh, easy pickings uh, with the rest of this Tampa lineup. Nobody's really going to hurt you. So we'll see what happens. But for uh, Logan Webb yesterday, good game for him whenever he got in trouble. He went to that changeup and got the double play ball when he needed it. But the offense really was the story of the game yesterday. And for the Giants, just to take a look at it and take you through it a little bit, <clears throat> in the first inning, uh, Wade gets a base hit. And then Conforto just hooks one down the right field line. Conforto's really doing a good job for the Giants. He's getting some big hits. And um, then the home run barrage started. Uh, Strata gets a home run in the fourth inning. And that puts the Giants up 2-1, to one, and he just crushed that one. Strata had a good day yesterday, three hits for him. Then all of a sudden in the fifth inning, uh, Lamont Wade just blasted one uh, with two out. And uh, Jung Ho Lee gets a double, and uh, then Wade takes one out, and that's uh, five runs already for the Giants, uh, f four runs already. And then, uh, then the parade starts, and this is the story about today as well. You want to get into that Tampa Bay uh, middle relief. And Davinsky came in yesterday. He walked everybody. Yaz got a two-out, uh, got a two-run single. And Bailey got a double. And here's three more runs. Uh, Soler hit one a, a million miles. He won like 450 feet. He got into one. He knocked one out. Estrada hit another home run that was gone. And uh, Chapman. Ended up with a home run in the ninth inning to right center field where he likes to hit it. So good game yesterday. Really, good game yesterday for the Giants. They got it done. Webb, seven innings, six hits a run. Uh, one walk and four strikeouts. Pepio was good for a while, but as I say, the Giants hit very well yesterday, and they square this uh, series at one and one. Uh, runners in scoring position, it didn't really matter because they hit the ball out of the park three for 11. But they did get six walks, and I'll say it again. Uh, the walks help, and when you get it against a team like Tampa Bay that's got a lot of trouble with that middle relief, you want to get into that middle relief. And today they will be in the Tampa Bay middle relief. Now we've got our contest today. Don't forget, it's Sunday, and if uh, at Baseball Marty on Twitter, uh, and you put in the score of today's game, and you can win dinner for two at Original Joe's in North Beach, West Lake, or West Portal. And uh, Raf breaks all the ties. And uh, we'll get you the winner tomorrow morning. And we'll let you know this afternoon the people who are eligible. But it's a great contest. You'll enjoy it. And uh, Tampa Bay is going to go with it, an opener today. And Raf and I were just talking about it. Sean Armstrong. And he's been around. Uh, this is a right-hander. He's 33 years old. 
uh, 6'2", 225, from New Bern, North Carolina. But he's really been an odyssey of uh, a major league career. He's an 18th round pick of Cleveland in 2011. He's out of East Carolina, and he's been all over the place. Uh, this is only his 11th major league start, his 248th game. So he's really a reliever. And he gets lefties out, and I guess that's why they're going to start him uh, for Lee and for Wade and Conforto in the first inning. Then we'll see what they do after that. But lefties are 0 for 9 against them this year. Righty's 6 for 14. But he's been with Cleveland, Seattle, Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore and Tampa Bay, Miami and Tampa Bay, back to Tampa Bay. As I said to Raph, he must be married to someone in the Tampa Bay front office because he always seems to show up here. So he's a big right-hander, 33 years old, and he goes today for Tampa Bay uh, against the Giants. The Giants have seen him. Ahmed 0 for 2, Chapman 2 for 7 with a homer, uh, Strada 1 for 2, Flores 0 for 1, Murph 0 for 2, and Soler 0 for 3. So that's what we got today for Tampa Bay. It is an opener, I assume, if that's what they do, Sean Armstrong, then followed probably by the lefty Tyler Alexander, who we thought was going to start today, and I assume he will come in and be their bulk guy today. And again, uh, lefties one for 12 against them, righties 13 for 30. So we'll have to see how Bob Melvin uh, has that lineup today because it looks like the Tampa Bay theory is get some pitchers in who can get lefties out. So maybe we'll see more of Slater today. Maybe we'll see Flores today. It'll be interesting to see the lineup that Bob Melvin runs out there today. For the Giants today, it's Blake Snell. I love him. Uh, this guy is good. He is really good. And he played for Tampa Bay. They'll probably do some sort of presentation to him before the game today to honor him. But uh, he was a major part of Tampa Bay going to the World Series. This guy can pitch. Uh, his first game uh, was last Monday night. And, look, he's not in complete shape yet. But he doesn't give in. And that's what I really like about him. He does not give in. And he went three innings, uh, three hits, three runs uh, given up, a uh, few walks given up, some stolen bases, and uh, he got caught in a rundown at first base where he had to make a throw to the plate that didn't work. Will and I will talk about that today. But this guy's tough. Uh, there's no question in my mind. Uh, when he gets you two strikes, he's going to put you away. It's um, what he had 245 strikeouts last year. An earn run average of, what, 225 and a Cy Young for Blake Snell. So this is the story of the Giants. I Just wait. Just wait for this summer uh, to see what this pitching rotation is going to look like. Uh, the Dodgers win yesterday over San Diego. Gavin Stone, where did he come from? He retired the first 15 for the Dodgers yesterday, and they eventually beat the Padres 5-2. Uh, to two. Rain delay in L.A. yesterday, two hours, 15 minutes. How about that? But they got the game in. Dodgers didn't get an extra base hit yesterday and still won the game. Uh, the last 41 times that happened, they're 2-39. and 39. So yesterday, of course, no extra base hits, and they end up beating the Padres 5-2. to two. That's what happened there. So the Dodgers uh, get Paxton today and Darvish for San Diego there. So the Dodgers win uh, yesterday. But wait till these uh, Dodger-Giant games, these series take place, and you get uh, Webb and Snell and Harrison and Hicks, and, uh, you know, you're going to face Yamamoto, and who knows if Bueller will be back by then. Uh, Bobby Miller, their phenom, has got a bad shoulder. He's going to go on the I.L. for a while, so we'll see what happens there. Paxton goes for them tonight. He pitched well against the Giants uh, earlier. But just wait. For this summer, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. With this pitching rotation like this, uh, it's going to be good. This week, the Giants take on the Marlins, as I said. The Marlins uh, won a game finally, but you know who the Giants are going to They're going to get three lefties this week. So they're going to get lefty-oriented today. Maybe we'll see some of the righties, but I'll guarantee you we're going to see a lot of the right-handed bench uh, for the Giants this week. They get A.J. Puck. Formerly with the A's, he's starting now because of all the injuries to the Marlins pitchers. Uh, Weathers, who used to be with San Diego, the Giants have blasted him before. And Rogers, uh, the lefty and the Giants have hit him before. And who do the Giants throw? They throw Harrison, Hicks, and Wynn. Come on. 
against the Marlins. So this is just the beginning of, of what I see, uh, some good things happening with this ball club this year. Uh, Arizona did win uh, yesterday over the Cardinals as Ryan Nelson pitched, and we may see him Friday night uh, when Arizona comes in, at least the beginning of the series. But they beat the Cardinals uh, last night in Arizona, 30, what that, 33,000, something like that. Uh, they're drawing. Of course, they won a world. They won a pennant, um, obviously, not the World Series against Texas, but uh, the fans are coming out for Arizona down here. So that's a little look at what happened yesterday. Seventeen thousand at the Trop yesterday. Two hours, twenty-seven minutes in a game the Giants won eleven to two. And today it is Blake Snell, and we've got him going against uh, Sean Armstrong at least to start, and we'll see where things go after that. Uh, we've got a good show for you today. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're going to have a good author coming on now. I'll tell you about him. Uh, and then we've got Glenn Kuyper coming up. We'll talk some ball with Glenn. I want to talk to him about being in Tampa Bay and playing in games in Tampa Bay. We haven't seen anything crazy yet. Uh, and is this a home run park? I mean, the Giants hit five yesterday. Is it known as a home run park? talk about that and a little bit about Tampa Bay, the team the Giants are seeing, because uh, Glenn has seen them a lot. Uh, Bruce Jenkins will be with us. Uh, the professor will be with us, uh, Ron Wotus. And uh, then we've got some special things about Jackie Robinson that I want to talk about. Tomorrow is Jackie Robinson Day. It's tax day, too. Don't forget that. Uh, but it is Jackie Robinson Day tomorrow. And uh, Raf has gone into our, our, our archives, and I think he's come up with a couple of things that you're going to enjoy uh, that we always acknowledge Jackie Robinson Day uh, every every year. All right, so uh, Matt uh, Seeger is up next. The book he wrote is called The God Squad, The Born Again San Francisco Giants of 1978, and it's a real slice of Giants history, believe me. Uh, it's an interesting interview with him, but you remember back to Gary Lavelle and Bob Nepper and things like that, and there was an issue uh, in the clubhouse, and there was an issue in the media of the God Squad. This is a slice of baseball history and U.S. history back in 1978, and Matt Seeger wrote about it, and I think you're going to find it interesting. Uh, if you're a Giants fan, if you remember back to those days, or you don't remember, uh, this is a real slice of Giants history. All right, more coming up right here, KMBR 680. We are streaming 104.5, the sports leader. At Chain Company, we believe everyone deserves a personal jeweler, a friend to guide you, to help you find jewelry that feels like it was made just for you, or a gift that will spark joy for that special someone. Chain Company's jewelry is crafted with the greatest care and held to the highest quality standards so it will last a lifetime. We're passionate about bringing you the most beautiful gemstones, exquisite diamonds, rubies, and sapphires in every color of the rainbow so you will always shine your brightest. Our jewelry is designed for you. With so many styles and endless ways to customize your piece, you can create a necklace that's meaningful to you, an engagement ring to tell your love story, or a stack of bracelets to let your personality shine. Discover a more personal jewelry experience and modern heirlooms as unique as you are. We're all made to shine. Shane Company, fine jewelry since 1929. Experience the epitome of luxury and craftsmanship with Inicio Windows and Doors, another exciting product line from BMD Manufacturing. Inicio Windows and Doors sets the standard in ultra-premium European design, wow, for the most demanding American building standards. Available both in steel and aluminum, they are meticulously engineered to elevate your living space to new heights of sophistication. Learn more about Inicio Windows and Doors today Discover the perfect blend of European beauty and style with unwavering durability and strength. Visit IniciaWindows.com. I-N-I-C-I-O Windows.com. Inicio Windows and Doors, where European design meets American craftsmanship. Matt Coker here from West Coast Men's Health. Guys, Viagra is not the answer for your problem. I know you think it is. 
but Viagra has horrible side effects, and for most men, the longer you're on it, the less it works. Viagra is not a curative medication. It's not fixing your problem. It's a Band-Aid for a shark bite. Acoustic Wave Therapy is the newest technology that can correct your problem, not just treat it. We can do something that no pill can do. We can restore your blood flow naturally. Get off Viagra today. Change your life like the thousands of men who already have, regardless of your age or your medical history. If you're tired of dealing with Peroni's disease or erectile dysfunction, then call West Coast Men's Health today. With clinics in San Mateo, Pleasanton, Walnut Creek, and Elk Grove, call 650-407-1167. That's 650-407-1167. 650-407-1167. Online at westcoastmenshealth.com. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. Hey guys, did you know there's a generic form of Viagra that works just the same, but is 95% cheaper and you can get it online? Go to hymns.com slash joy. Through Hims, you'll get a free medical consultation, discreet shipping if prescribed, and the process is 100% online. To start your free online visit, go to hymns.com slash joy. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash J-O-Y. Giants Baseball on KMBR is sponsored by your California Ford dealers. Check out deals right now on buyfordnow.com. What a beautiful day for baseball. I ran into Gene Bogato on opening day, and he said that it's absolutely beautiful, not only up on the Sonoma coast, but also on the way out there. The wet weather has resulted in spectacular scenery in the countryside with lush green fields showcasing the farms and ranches of Sonoma County, and it makes for a beautiful, pleasant drive. Wow, sounds like the Peterman catalog. And once you get to Bodega Bay, the tides wharf and the luxurious in at the tides are waiting for you. From delicious meals any time of day at the wharf to the large updated rooms at the inn, there's something for everyone looking for a break, and we all need it. So if you're looking for that special getaway not far from the Bay Area, remember the Tides Wharf and the Inn at the Tides in scenic Bodega Bay. Hi, I'm Brian Bakhtiari, executive manager of the brand new Stevens Creek Lincoln. When something has been around for over 100 years, it typically needs no introduction. With the belief that a vehicle should be more than just transportation and a continued focus on innovation, the Lincoln Motor Company and Stevens Creek Lincoln partner to create California's first Lincoln Boutique. Experience your own personal sanctuary in the Stevens Creek Lincoln Boutique in Valley Fair Mall. Our hosts and curators will tailor each visit to your needs, whether that's in the mall, online, the comforts of home, or work with pickup and delivery services the black label experience and membership perks that no one else delivers you owe it to yourself to experience luxury with stevens creek lincoln call or visit us to experience luxury on your terms at stevens creek lincoln in valley fair we will help guide you through all of the interior and exterior options whether you want to custom build your vehicle or take delivery of our new or certified pre-owned vehicles stevens creek lincoln is located in valley fair mall or online at sclincoln.com and remember to always buckle up and drive safe Fans, it's great to have you back with us as we get ready for Giants baseball. A pleasure to bring a, an interesting author to you, Matt Seeger, and he's written a book. It's called The God Squad, The Born Again San Francisco Giants of 1978. And this is an interesting subject. And you know, for us, we are baseball historians, and we look at the United States, and we look at U.S. history, and how everything in U.S. history showed up on a baseball diamond. And this is another example of that. So, Matt, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you with us. How are you? Very good, Marty, and I really appreciate uh, you having me. Sure. The book is The God Squad, and I remember uh, 1978 and some of the controversy that came around this uh, subject. But let's talk about you and your interest in it and how you approached uh, this subject. And it's going to be an interesting conversation. So go ahead. Okay, um, Marty. Well, it goes back about 40 years. Uh, my brother-in-law and his brother 
were attending South San Francisco High School, and they became born-again Christians, and they started a club uh, which was affiliated with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And for that club, they would bring in speakers, and they were successful in getting uh, many of the born-again giants, the so-called God Squad, to come and speak. I believe Mike Ivey spoke. Uh, I think Mark Hill uh, was one of the speakers. And then Gary Lavelle came. And my brother-in-law, well, he wasn't my brother-in-law at the time, but he, he told me about the meeting. And I went, I listened to Gary, and afterwards I asked Gary if I could write an article for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes magazine about it. And we did that, got it published, met with him again, because this was early 1980s, and it was right at the time where there were a lot of columns taking pot shots at the God Squad, notably uh, Glenn Dickey and Lowell Cohn. Uh, and uh, it sort of kind of bugged me. It was like uh, uh, it didn't seem fair to me to the players. Uh, talked to Gary about doing a book on the subject, and he was open to it, but we soon realized neither of us had the time. And so I just dropped it 40 years later after there retiring. Yeah. <laughs> after uh, retiring as a sports writer uh, for Vacaville uh, newspaper, uh, I was thinking I'd like to write a book, but I couldn't think what to write about. The only thing that came to mind was the God squad. Uh, <laughs> I got back in touch with, uh, with Gary Lavelle and and uh, reached out to Bob Nepper and Lowell Cohn and also Henry Schulman of the Chronicle, and that was the beginning of the book. All right, this is going to be interesting. Let me tell you a little bit about Matt. Uh, he has a BA from Cornell University and a master's degree in magazine journalism from Syracuse, the university's Newhouse School of Public Communications. As he said, he was a sports reporter for the Cortland New York Standard the Vacaville Reporter, and the Martinez News Gazette. Matt, uh, let's talk about the God Squad, because in the book you talk about 1978, and this was a relatively new phenomenon, that a, a Christian ball player in the 50s and 60s didn't speak openly about their faith, and here we are in 78, and now this has happened, and there is a reaction to it. So let's talk about that part of it. Sure. Well, it was a perfect storm, Marty, because... Uh, of course, San Francisco is, is pretty liberal in, in politics and in terms of uh, uh, areas uh, such as, uh, well, uh, drug use was pr pretty prominent uh, at the time. Uh, there, there was an atmosphere that was not conducive, let's say, to people talking about their faith. Uh, it was a, a kind of a a, a liberal atmosphere, and that's why the God Squad was a perfect storm, because when these guys started to speak out, uh, it, it seemed very foreign to uh, the reporters and I think even to the public. And uh, the, the, um, the reporters weren't quite sure how to handle it, and out of that came some uh, satirical columns and some uh, actual uh, – denouncing of the God Squad by uh, Glenn Dickey. Um, and, and that stirred up things, and that, that began the controversy, really. Well, a lot goes on here because uh, the ball players. Uh, one of the issues uh, that's written about, well, the ball player may say, well, it was God's will that this happened and uh, this and that, and uh, this is why I lost the game, and maybe they lost their competitiveness. Because the, the term God Squad appears to have been coined by the Chronicle's columnist Art Rosenbaum in 1979, but he didn't use it negatively. Uh, the other writers grabbed onto the term and began to use it the way you just described as the team's uh, fortunes uh, faded in 1979, because 78 was a great year for mm -hmm. Giants baseball, and they just lost it at the end. So we have the God Squad. What is the God Squad exactly? Because was it a something where they prayed in the clubhouse? Did they do it separately? Was it divisive with the team? What, what, what was it exactly that we're talking about? Then you and I will talk about some of the columns that were written about it. Uh, but let's, let's try to define what it looked like in a clubhouse. And I think that's the issue that we really want to get to because that's, that's the baseball story. 
Right. And uh, the God Squad, what, what happened was uh, Gary Lavelle uh, in 1976 became a born-again Christian. Uh, and then in 77, uh, he began to share his beliefs with some of the other players, and he was instrumental in uh, in Bob Nepper becoming a believer, uh, uh, Rob Andrews. Um, uh, he had an impact. So by the time you get to 78, you've got eight or nine people who, who are uh, born-again Christians. Uh, and uh, like you say, our term uh, – term them the uh the god squad but uh in terms of the dynamic in the clubhouse that was greatly misrepresented by the media because there really was no division they had a baseball chapel on sunday but it was never held in the clubhouse it was always in a separate area um so there was never uh and this is from uh the lips of gary lavelle there there was never any praying in the clubhouse or in the locker room or uh, proselytizing or, uh, you know, and Gary was very low key, uh, wasn't a preacher, uh, but he just, you know, befriended some of the other players who, and if they had an interest, he talked about it. Um, So it it got so ridiculous in in the press that one story was that there were two separate buses, uh, one for the God squatters, and and one for the other players to take them to the ballpark, which was totally uh, a fabrication. And the only thing I can trace it to is a funny comment that manager Dave Bristol made. He said, uh, we have two buses, uh, one for those who need more work, and then the empty bus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, stories like that, they got a life of their own and uh and were repeated and 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 that was one of the big problems uh is that the story would would just carry on uh even if there was no basis for it i think one uh, matt seeger is with us the book is the god squad it, it's really a good historical piece of what went on in the late 70s early 80s i think one thing that i get from the the book and reading some of the uh the quotes and the stories uh, something like Bob Nepper, uh, if he lost the game, it was God's will, uh, that sort of stuff. And then I think that is sort of feeds into uh, that you're not as competitive, you're not this tough ball player anymore. So was there mm-hmm. truth to that? What about that part of it? I examine that pretty closely. I have a chapter called The Killer Instinct, where the very accusation you said is is hurled at the players. And uh, the players uh, pretty vigorously refute that. Um, uh, you have, uh, you know, I, I know um, I quoted some other Christians from other ball players, people I had interviewed over the years for magazine articles. One of them was Alvin Davis of the Seattle Mariners. He said, how do you become a major leaguer and not care about winning? Uh, it's like these guys are super competitive. Gary Lavelle said the same thing. And and I think the clincher is if you talk to the non-Christian teammates about these guys, they said they were very competitive. They they uh, I, I remember uh, 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 John Montefusco, the count, uh, he said he hated to come out of a ball game, but he was glad when Gary Lavelle came in because he was such a, a kick-ass competitor. Um, so the other players didn't see that in, in their, the God Squatters, uh, and uh, there just was really no truth to that. Okay. All right. So now there is a media reaction to this, and this is sort of baseball. <laughs> this is why we love baseball, why you were in the media as well, and I am too. Uh, we comment on what we think is something that may affect the game, uh, may affect the season, or may affect the player. So Glenn Dickey, who was a very famous writer in the late 70s, early 80s, and well before that and after that, and Lowell Cohn, one of the outstanding writers uh, of of our generation, really, the San Francisco Chronicle and the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, um, wrote about this in in somewhat similar ways but different in, in a sense, too. You got to speak to Lowell Cohn. I'm interested in his reaction today to what mm-hmm. he wrote before, because he has one of those mm-hmm. quotes, can Satan save the Giants? 
you know, and, and then he wrote a column about it, as, as only Lowell can in his way, which are fabulous columns. But let's talk about Glenn Dickey and Lowell Cohn a little bit, how they approached it. Sure. Uh, if you've read Glenn Dickey over the years, you know he's very opinionated and uh, he's a great writer. I mean, he, he, he gets his points across, but he was pretty heavy handed toward the God Squatters. He recommended that they break up what he called the clique and trade some of them. And uh, I find that's going over the top when you're, you know, uh, suggesting that somebody be traded because of their religious preference. That that seemed over the top to me. Now, Lowell, on the other hand, as you know, is always satirical and can be very funny. And he's equal opportunity with his satire. So when he took on the God Squad, it was – you know, he would have done that with any other group. Um, and and it was funny, but the uh, the column, Can Satan Save the Giants, did not go over well uh, with, with the born-again Christians. Uh, the idea of one player on the team should sell their soul to the devil because it, it, God wasn't really helping them too much in 1979. So, <laughs> so that, was, that was the joke. Only um, Lowell could do that. I, I yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that stirred things up. But in talking to Lowell, I, I must say I had a great uh, phone interview with him about 45 minutes. I expected a prickly, abrasive, you know, defensive kind of guy because that's you know, I read his columns and he, you know, uh, he, he's pretty ornery that way. But he was just the opposite. He was he was very cordial, uh, encouraging, friendly. And uh, you know, you asked uh, how he felt about it looking back. The the thing he expressed is that he was a young man, and he said sometimes he was kind of precipitous in his uh, uh, comments and writing, and he hopes that he didn't offend. And he said he never had anything against the God Squatters, and you know, uh, it it was to him it was satire, and it wasn't uh, uh, taken that way uh, in some cases. But he says looking back, you know. Uh, uh, maybe he's mellowed a little bit. Maybe he he would have done it a little differently. But uh, uh, you know, he was uh, it was great uh, just having the opportunity to talk with him. Well, what I like about the book, uh, many of the columns of Glenn Dickey and Lowell Cohn are quoted uh, in the book with a little dialogue that goes with it on your behalf. But it really gives a lot of context to what was being said at that time and that's the purpose of of this whole interview is to say here's a baseball team this is what is going on within the baseball team this is the reaction of the media to it did it affect the baseball team did it affect the players did their beliefs mm -hmm. affect the way they play baseball and that's what you deal with in the book at least with the the topics that were brought up at that point and i think you did a very good job of of presenting all of those facts uh, in, in determining whether this was an issue like that. Uh, Matt Seeger is with us. Matt, as we wrap it up, uh, the God Squad criticism was not just in the Bay Area. Peter Gammons of The Globe, uh, Dick Young of the New York Daily News took pot shots uh, at the Born Again Giants as well. We have a God Squad 2 that you talk about uh, that comes up in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's also in the book. So you cover a lot of ground. You do. And you're a good historian because oh, you thank brought. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're a good yeah. historian because you brought to light uh, this issue and you presented all the sides of it through the media, mm -hmm. through the ball club, with first person interviews as well. So uh, I like the book and I, I'd recommend people getting it. Uh, it is called The God Squad, The Born Again San Francisco Giants of 1978. You're going to learn some baseball history and social history as well. David up in the book tree in Montclair, I'm sure, has it. Matt, how does someone get the book if they want it? Amazon is probably the easiest route. Um, just put in my name, Matt Seeger, S-I-E-G-E-R, God Squad. The, the version that will pop up is the one with 13 uh, black and white photos for twenty one ninety five. If you click on the little blue highlighting thing that says uh, uh, other versions, it will go to the other version for twenty eight ninety five, which has those same 13 photos in color. Ah, and, okay. Uh, yeah. And so there are two versions of the book. Terrific. Well, congratulations on it, and I'm glad that we could have you on. And as I like to say, 
Everything that ever happens in the United States through U.S. history shows up on the baseball field, and this was mm -hmm. part of the 70s and uh, what was going on, and it certainly showed up within the Giants and the clubhouse in 1978. So, Matt, thanks again, and be well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. All right, more coming up, KMBR 680-1045, the sports leader. Excitement is in the guards at Bay 101 Casino. Some of your favorite table games have no additional fees for bonus bets, like the three card nine over three card seven Baccarat bonus bet that pays 200 to one. 21st century blackjack with a lucky, lucky bonus bet. And three card poker. Enjoy great food or a refreshing cocktail right at your gaming table. Go to bay101.com or see them off 101 in San Jose. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Have you seen this week's Something Extra member deals at Rayleigh's and Knob Hill? Now through Tuesday, click your digital member deal online or in the app to get large packs of Rayleigh's fresh, boneless, skinless chicken breasts with no antibiotics ever for $1.97 a pound limit two packs. Just click your deal at Rayleigh's.com or in the Rayleigh's app before checkout to save. And clip your digital member deal to get one dozen Rayleigh's large cage-free eggs for just $2.97 each limit four. That's savings you can count on. That's Rayleigh's and Knob Hill. Just a quick note about the rooftop restaurant at the Via Hotel, the Hotel Via across the street from the park. They do a wide variety of events on the rooftop from weddings and birthdays to corporate retreats and special events, holiday events, and any other special occasion you can think of. With stunning 360 views of the skyline, Bay Bridge, East Bay, and of course, Oracle Park, the rooftop at Via is truly one of the most unique event venues in San Francisco. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. Hey guys, did you know there's a generic form of Viagra that works just the same but is 95% cheaper and you can get it online? Go to hymns.com slash joy. Through Hymns, you'll get a free medical consultation, discreet shipping if prescribed, and the process is 100% online. To start your free online visit, go to hymns.com slash joy. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash J-O-Y. Ooh, ah, what was that? That is Business Phone Bliss. Business Phone Bliss with the UMA Cloud Phone System. It handles all our voice, video, and messaging needs. You sound very calm. I am. Because UMA has everything I need to run my business more efficiently, like virtual receptionist, call routing, ring groups, and video conferencing. And that means? Our people can use it wherever and whenever they want, from their mobile phone, computer, or desk phone. You mean? Yes, anywhere. But isn't changing over a pain in the... Switching to UMA is a cinch. And it starts at just $19.95 per month per user, plus taxes and fees. That really is... Bliss. I know. Now go ahead and say it. It feels good. Uma. Nice. Find your business com at uma.com slash radio. That's O-O-M-A dot com slash radio. Fans, great to have you back with us. Joining us is Grant Power, the president and CEO of Nations, as we get ready for Nations and Marty Lurie for 29 years together. Grant, what's new with Nations as we get into this season? 2024 is, I think, our most exciting season yet. And we've made the decision after 72 years to finally push ahead and franchise. We talk about the American dream historically for our company with a real focus on our managers getting promoted through the ranks and then getting their own store and then getting our very generous bonus this program we are now very very eager to find the perfect franchise partners we want anybody who's a, a fan and passionate about our brand to have the opportunity to buy a nation store for themselves carry on our legacy and become part of our family we've already sold our first three franchisees in northern california we are doing this in southern california where we're slated to have
have a bakery for our pies operational, and we're selling franchisees in Oklahoma and Texas as we speak. That's really what 2024 is all about for us, protecting the stores that we already have, taking greater care of our customers than we ever have. But this is really the year that we want to expand the family and open up the dream of owning a nation to everybody. Wow, great, great idea. What a milestone for nations. Congratulations. Are you a business owner ready to embark on the next chapter of your business journey? Selling your business is not just a culmination of your hard work, but can also be the key to unlocking your financial freedom. I'd like to introduce my brand new book called The Entrepreneur's Exit Strategy because this book can reshape your future. Hi, I'm David Hollander, CEO and founder of The Liberty Group and host of Protect Your Assets. Imagine planning a path toward a comfortable and rewarding retirement leveraging your entrepreneurial success for a brighter future. And right now I'm giving away my brand new book for free to anyone who calls this number, 866-PROTECT. If you need a structured approach to exiting your business, this book is for you. Business owners, find out what you don't know, 866-PROTECT. That's 866-PROTECT for your free copy. Next pitch, Estrada swings, belts one, deep left. It's on its way. It is gone. Tyro Estrada, a two-out solo home run here in the fourth. It gives the Giants back the lead. It's two to one. All right, great to have you back with us as we get ready for some more uh, Giants baseball game two, game three between uh, Tampa Bay and the Giants. And this series is tied up 1-1. Got a nice text from uh, Greg Papa. Papa, I'm glad you're up early listening to the show today. You enjoyed the interview with Matt Seeger. I, I enjoyed it as well. It's a real slice of uh, Giants history, the God Squad. I remember that so well and what was written about it. So uh, if you didn't hear the interview and you're just tuning in now, uh, RAF archives that at KMBR.com or lovethegameproductions.com. Joining us now is Glenn Kuyper. We love talking ball every Sunday with Glenn. Glenn, how are you? I'm doing good, God. Can I call you the Godfather? I like that. That sounds pretty good. Yeah, as long as you don't call me the God Squad, that's okay. No, the you're, God. You're, the God, you're the Godfather. <laughs> It's good I love to talk it. to you nice and early this morning, but uh, that's okay. Yeah, really. Well, you've done so many games down in Tampa uh, at that ballpark. Nothing crazy has happened yet, but you <laughs> give me your take on that ballpark and what it's like playing there. You know, it's funny. I, I talked to my brother Dwayne last night about, because he's only been there, you know, a couple times. You know, I was there every year. Um, <clears throat> but. You know, I didn't. I didn't think it was a bad place to broadcast a game. Honestly, the the booth was fine, and you know, you look at things like that. But it is a weird place. I mean, the rings up above, which are you know, three of the four are in play. If it hits one, it could be a home run. If it hits another <laughs> one, it's foul ball. So, it, I, I mean, I always wrote down in in my notebook, you know, what the ring rules were in that ballpark because. Because you needed to know if, if a ball hit up there, you needed to know what the ruling was. So, um, you know, it's kind of loud. They, can, they pump fake music in there, um, and there's not necessarily a lot of people. Um, so it, 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 it has a sterile feel to it. Um, but to the Rays' credit, the product on the field is always pretty darn good. So I, I didn't mind going there, um, you know, get a little beach time and, and go to the ballpark and do a game. So it, there's there's worse stops in Major League Baseball than stopping in St. Petersburg. Yeah, St. Petersburg is where the, the stadium is, and I think that's the problem that people talk about is that it's not in, in the main drag, so to speak. So when you mm -hmm. would go there, did you stay in Tampa and have to go to St. Pete? Is that the way it worked? No. No, we stayed right in St. Petersburg at uh, – uh, you know, there's some real nice hotels there, and, you know, and we stayed there. But – Right, right in St. Pete, but you know, there's not a, there's not a downtown, you know, high rise yeah. area really in St. Pete. Um, so that that's a little different. It's a little more mellow. You just feel like you're in a just a regular sized town. You know, you don't feel like you're in a, a real big market. I think if you were in Tampa, you would probably feel different. But um, 
<clears throat> yeah, we stayed right in St. Pete, you know, probably 10 minutes from the ballpark. And, and mm. that was fine, but it's just not – it's not that big city downtown feel when you're there if you do stay in St. Pete. Yeah, they're supposed to get a new park. We'll see how that uh, that works out, uh, see how they do that. But, boy, Glenn, Glenn Kuyper with us. Glenn, uh, I've watched Tampa for the last two days, and I realize Juan DeFranco has got issues in the Dominican Republic. But, boy, I- I'm looking at this team and saying, come on, this team won 100 games? This is not this is not your Tampa Bay Rays of last year or the year before. They just don't have any real punch right now. Yeah, it, you know, but but you know, Marty, it's funny we we find ourselves saying that about yeah. the Rays, you know, almost every year. And and I do agree with what you're saying. Offensively, they may be a little short, um, and, and you know, you don't have Franco, who is a middle of the order hitter, um, but they always seem to find a way to do it but now you know they're banged up pitching wise um you know so it does have maybe a little different look to it that that race team this year but you just can never underestimate them um and and for them to do what they do almost every year in that division is, is really pretty incredible um but yeah it looks like just you know just watching them a couple games and that you can't really get a full read on a team but yeah it looks like maybe they could be a little short offensively and and you know they're they're banged up pitching wise as well i think they're throwing a bullpen game today you know yeah. a young guy yesterday a, a, a 29 year old rookie the day that you know, in game one of the series so yeah it sounds like there could be some issues there but you just can't ever count them out yeah do you know anything about sean armstrong he's been in the, the american league forever since 2015 He's kicked around to Baltimore, Tampa Bay, Miami, Seattle. He is the opener today. Uh, big guy, 6'2", 225, from New Bern, North, North Carolina. So he must be a country guy. Yeah, well, he's probably friends with Bumgarner, right? Who knows? But, <laughs> really? no, I, I, you know what? I, I know the name, and I know I've seen him pitch before because you just kind of recognize the name. And, like, yeah, he came in a game somewhere we did. Um, but that, that's all I, I can remember. But I do, I do know he pitched – at some point against the A's in the last three or four years. Yeah, lefties 0 for 9 against them, so maybe that's why they want him in the first inning today. So be interesting to see what Bob Melvin does. Tyler Alexander was supposed to pitch. He's the lefty. Uh, I guess he'll be coming in after Armstrong. So who knows what will happen today. But on the Giants' side, we do get to see Snell today, and I'm excited for him. I, Glenn, I'll tell you. I like the guy. Uh, he does not give in. He's tough on the mound. The stuff is legit. He was a little little wild and, on Monday night, but uh, I can't wait to see him pitch today. Yeah, I mean, listen, at some point this this whole thing's going to gonna kick in for him. I mean, he's a little behind, obviously, with the late sign in spring training. Um, you know, he didn't look real sharp his first start, which I don't know that anybody was super surprised. I know – I know the Giants people felt like not that this was the reason or, or this was going to make a difference in the outcome of the game, but but the home plate umpire was really tight and was really squeezing them in that first start, and that snowballed a little bit. Mm. Um, again, that's not an excuse, but I do know they felt that way. Um, but listen, when it's all said and done, this guy is is, is going to have a good year, um, you know, and, and – and, it's just his second start, but I, I think he's looking forward to today a lot because he had some good years. You know, it's his original team he's pitching against. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too, because you know how good he is, and you just kind of are waiting for for all that to kick in and, and for him to be the dominant guy that he is. Um, and, and, you know, Mar- I mean, their pitching's been pretty darn good so far, I think. Yeah. I know that the team ERA is high. They got beat up a little bit early. But if you look at, you know, the last – week week and a half the starters have been pretty good the bullpen's been pretty good and, and and i think that's a real good sign well they're right up there i think i looked at it yesterday and quality starts you know six innings pitched three yeah. earned runs or less i think they're second or third in baseball in quality starts i think the pirates and the phillies were the only ones uh, ahead of them so they're they're doing what they're supposed to do what do you think we've learned about the giants they're six and nine uh, they're probably a little bit better than the record. They've hit the ball hard. What do you think we've learned here over the first couple of weeks about this ball club? Um, well, I think, you know, the the point of emphasis in the offseason 
or point of emphasis, a couple of them were let's get better defensively. I think they're clearly de- better defensively. I mean, there's no, there's really no argument there. It's, it's statistically they're better, but just just the eyeball test says to me that they're a lot better. And a lot of that has to do with the left side of the diamond. Um, so th- that that's a good thing. Um, and, and I think they're going to be fine offensively, Marty. And I know you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I don't think they're going to be a, a huge juggernaut of an offensive team. But I think that when it's all said and done, they have the ability to score enough runs to win – quite a few games because I think the pitching is going to be really good. Um, and I, and I like, you know, I know it's different than what Gabe Kapler did, but I saw Bob Melvin do it a lot in Oakland. He, 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 he wants to have as much of a set lineup as he can. Yeah. And you're seeing, you're seeing that early. I personally like that. Um, it, it just, I just think it, it lets guys relax, know where they're going to hit for the most part. Um, you know, there, there's going to be some pitch hitting, you know, in the middle of the game. But, but you know, most teams do that. But you're you're seeing pretty much the same seven or eight guys getting run out there every day. And, and that's the way Bob operates. And I think ultimately, I think that's the best way to do it. As long as you have seven or eight guys to run out there, Marty. That's, that's the thing. I don't know that yeah. in the last couple of years the Giants had that. Boy, interesting talking with Glenn Kuyper uh, this morning. It's game three between the Giants and the Rays today. Um, l- looking uh, ahead a little bit, I mean, Arizona's coming in Thursday. It is a four-game series. I, I, when I said it earlier, I said three games, but it is a four-game series. Then the Mets come in. Uh, you got that coming back. Uh, and, then, and then the Pirates. The, it's two weekends in a row. Uh, the Pirates come in uh, for a, a weekend series. This is this is going to be an interesting homestand coming up. Yeah, and important. You know, you don't you you want to stay with the pack, right? And you want to get yourself to five hundred, and then and then get moving. But isn't it funny, Marty? You look at the schedule, and and there's just never any breaks, right? It's <laughs> just you know everybody's you know you, you see a team in the schedule, and you're like, yeah, you know what? They're pretty good, or hey, they're playing good baseball right now, or they got some young guys that we don't know much about, but it's working. And and then the division you're in, you know, you, you just you just have to grind within that division. I mean, I look today, the two top scoring teams in all of Major League Baseball are the Dodgers and the Padres, right? Right. So you just you just can't get away from the competitiveness in that National League West, and, and you know, and then you like you said you're going to see the Diamondbacks for four games and. You know, we saw them how they run around and they drive you crazy with their team speed. So, no, there's just there's no such thing as a break in a big league schedule. It just you know you can look at records and all that, but it's just the, the, the teams just keep coming at you. And uh, but I, you know I, I I like I like the Giants team. I really do. Um, and I've said it before, and I'm going to stay with it. I can see them winning 86 to 87 games and. And, and grabbing a wild card spot. I think there's there's enough talent there and there's enough veteran leadership there. I, I think they're going to be fine. I do. Well, they're going to pitch like crazy uh, once yep. we get into July and August in this rotation. I'll give you a great example. They're going to play the Marlins. Now, you've been in that park a million times. It's a big park. It's not a great home run park. It's a little bit of a pitching park. But they're going to face, you know, A.J. Puck. Remember him? Uh, yep. probably face him. He's now a Marlin. Uh, Weathers, who we've seen, the uh, lefty. This is David Weathers' kid. Uh, and then t- Rogers, who's another lefty. And But the Giants are going to throw probably Harrison, Hicks, and Wynn. Come on. Yeah. And the Marlins are 1-8 and eight at home. I, we're going to see this kind of matchup uh, all all summer long. That that's I think yeah. that's what we're talking about. Yeah, and, and th- that's the good thing with this Giants rotation which is you know it's it's strong and it's deep and it's going to get deeper with Cobb coming back and all that and, and so you're all you, you always feel like you have a chance when you have a quality starter going out there and I think you can make the, the, the a pretty strong argument that if you look at the five guys now uh you got a chance every day you know yeah. I know Keaton Wynn is 0-3 but Keaton Wynn's got great stuff just watching him pitch I mean that's that's real stuff there uh, 
So, so that's a th- that that to me is is different than what we've seen the last couple of years. I always felt like Marty, and, and it, this is not a criticism necessarily of the 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 opener and and how you had to do that. Just maybe you were a little short, but you know, you just I never felt confident when your team started an opener. You know, you just like what what are we doing here? You know, and and I know that teams do it for 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 obvious reasons. Maybe your starters are banged up, but to me, just just mentally, it just it made you feel like you know what the heck's going on here, and maybe that's not fair. But I sure like knowing who's going to take the ball every fifth day, and knowing also Marty that you have some depth coming. I think that's a big deal. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm going to be stronger about it. The opener stinks. No good. <laughs> No good. I, don't... I, I wanted to say that, Marty, but I'm not the godfather. You are. so. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. No. Look, Tampa Bay's got to do it today. The, their middle relief is awful. Uh, their their bullpen yeah. is like last in the American League, and this is going to be interesting today to see how this works because we will see the opener today. One last thing for you. Uh, Justin Verlander's on his way back. I know he did another rehab start uh, for the Astros last night. Not great. But I want to get your thoughts about Justin Verlander. Who knows if he's got anything left? The shoulder's a problem for him. You've seen him pitch a lot of big games. Uh, Justin Verlander, Hall of Famer, no doubter. What do you say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt. He, and he was he was one of my favorite. He's always been one of my favorite pitchers, even though – you know, he pitched a lot of great games against the A's. He dominated the A's many, many times, including in the postseason. Yeah. But I just I just love the way he, he goes about his business, right? He's I mean, he's a little cocky, which I think you want, but when he walked out on the mound, I mean, he walked out there like, you know, I got this, this is mine, and you guys are in trouble. And and he walked off the mound the same way. Had a little strut. And he still has that. And, and listen, not everybody's as good as Justin Verlander, but that's the way you want your starting pitcher to be. And and he he just he just kind of oozes that confidence, like, yeah, I, I'm I'm going to probably dominate you today. And even if he doesn't, you still feel like he could at any time. One of my favorite pitchers to to watch pitch, just because of you know the longevity and still being able to to do what he yeah. does. At such a high level at his age, and he takes good care of himself. And and I know a lot of people. I read a lot of things about him where he he really is a good veteran, and he really takes care of and helps young pitchers. And I think that's an important thing too, especially for for somebody who has a resume like him. Yeah, boy, the Astros need him. They're they're yep. really struggling. We'll talk about the Astros in Texas and the American League a little bit more next week. All right, have a great Sunday. By the way, Pablo got Verlander a couple of times. That was one of the great looks of all, of all yeah. time. I love Ver- Verlander's look. Hey, yeah, the, what just the happened? Strut off the mound. The really? strut off the mound wasn't quite as good. You're right. <laughs> I loved it. All right, hey, have a great Sunday, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks, Marty. See you later, buddy. Uh, pleasure. All right, that is Glenn Kuyper. More coming up. Bruce Jenkins next right here on the Sports Leader.
Fans, nothing better than spending an afternoon at the Priest Ranch Wine Tasting Room in Yountville. You can relax as you enjoy a selection of limited production estate wines paired with local artisanal cheese and charcuterie. Your host will guide you through each unique pairing while sharing the incredible story of Priest Ranch. Now, while you're there, you must try the food at our new restaurant, The Kitchen at Priest Ranch. It's right next door to the Priest Ranch Tasting Room and serves amazing, fast, casual food. That's an afternoon. Everyone likes a party, but everyone loves a party at Original Joe's. With three private dining rooms, it's the perfect spot to hold your next big event. From christenings to corporate gatherings, we'll make your next party San Francisco special. Original Joe's, see you at the counter. All right, great to have you back with us as we get ready for Sunday baseball. We bring in Bruce Jenkins. Bruce, good morning. How are you? Doing well, Marty. The alarm went off. The coffee's <laughs> brewing, so it's all good. Very good. Hey, uh, boy, the bats woke up yesterday. It's so funny to watch baseball. And, you know, we do a whole show. They don't hit. They can't hit. They don't hit home runs. They're tied with the Marlins. And yesterday they turned into the uh, the 61 Yankees. Yeah, <laughs> Johnny Blanchard. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Everybody homered on that team. Really? Come on. They, they must have 250 homers with 
Roger Maris hitting 61. And what, I think he, Mickey, had, he had something to do with it, too. <laughs> and Mickey, Mickey had like 54 or something, something like yeah, that. Yeah, beautiful but, year for the Yanks. But, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we talk about this all the time. As soon as you see a trend in baseball, you just you wait till the next day and it'll be completely reversed. I mean, you know, five homers, Estrada hits two. Soler hit one out of sight. I mean, he really, really hit yeah. one. Uh, Chapman's going to count his, even though it came against, uh, you know, Ben Rortvet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was just a really, uh, really fun day. And Webb, Webb pitched great, so you know they feel a lot better about about things right now. Yeah, I thought Webb, Webb, Bruce, he gets the double play when he needs it. You know, yeah. they always say the double play is the pitcher's best friend. When he gets that ball on the ground to Chapman, forget it. You could put yeah. it in the book. It, it's over. Yeah, and yeah, Chapman and Estrada had a really nice double play. They they they, they ruled the guy safe after a replay at first, but Estrada made a beautiful turn. And you know, Chapman just he's so sure-handed. He gets rid of the ball quick. That's that just makes all the difference. You know, it can make make a big difference in the late innings. So, uh yeah, and Webb, you know, I I love what Melvin did when he came out in the seventh, so you're thinking back to uh, not just Gabe Kapler, but a lot of managers. You know, they're well. We, we, good job. You know, we're going to the bullpen, and the guy walks off the mound, and he's not really that happy. But uh, he he left Webb in. As Tommy Lopez said, he wants to give Webb a chance to walk off the mound to end the inning, and that's what he did. And I think those things are huge. Yeah, it's different. It's different with him. The other thing that Glenn Kuyper pointed out, he he uses the same lineup all the time. I Love mean, it. you know, he, he's got Murphy on the bench and Fitzgerald, Slater, Flores. You know, he's only got a four-man bench, really. But he basically runs that same lineup out and basically the same batting order. I, I think it's great. You know, it's obviously what, you know, we're used to in the game that we knew for years, and that's the way teams did it. The fans got familiar with it. They, they could almost fill out the score, you know, the lineup before the game themselves before they see it. And uh, it, it's great for a guy like Yaz, you know, who's been struggling. He got a good uh, two-run single uh, last night. But, you know, for somebody like him or really anybody who's struggling to see that faith uh, coming in when they come the next day and they're in the lineup, it's, it's a big deal. Now, you know, there, there's, a, there's obviously a point to it. Um, you know, if you don't hit at all, they're gonna they're gonna put somebody else in there. But right now, I, I I'm I'm enjoying the, the it's, a, it's a familiar lineup, and I think the fans enjoy it too. You know, I always say in April and May, you kind of figure out who you are, and I'm kind of getting a feel for this ball club. They are six and nine. Uh, they have a real shot here at, at straightening this record out with the game today against an opener, and you get into that Tampa Bay bullpen, and you got Snell going today. Then it's three with the Marlins, and they're one and eight at home. And uh, as I was saying to Glenn, you got Harrison, Hicks, and Wynn uh, against the Marlins down there. But I, I'm starting to get a feel for this team that this is what it's going to look like for the season. Well, I just think it's a fun watch uh, on television, that just the anticipation of what Lee might do. Uh, you know, he's a contact hitter, the bit running the bases, plays a fearless center field, and what Soler might do. You know, Bailey making a throw down. Uh, Chapman at third. They're, they're, they've, they've got a lot of talent. That, you know, they, they don't have maybe the greatest all-around players in the game, but they've got guys with talent and, and a little flair. You know, they, these are important things as the season goes on. They're, they're, they've been dull the last week, I, you have to admit that, but they basically are not that at all. And, yeah, the Miami series, you know, they're loading up. Uh, you know, they, they've got a good pitcher out there every 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 night. I was wondering if the if – the, uh, they might see this kid Max Meyer from Miami, who, who's, yeah. who's been really good. He 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 was great against Atlanta yesterday. He struck out, I think, seven guys in six innings. They just they're going to just miss him. Uh, he yeah. he won't pitch in that series. But um, you know that that's that to me is a series where the Giants ought to go in and get at least two because Miami, like you say, they're reeling and the the clubhouse mood hasn't been great and and uh, could be a chance to uh, make some hay, as they say. Yeah, no, absolutely. Meyer pitched yesterday, pitched really well, and Lazardo goes today. Yeah. And the the one guy, their their big hitter is Brian De La Cruz. Uh, that, <laughs> that that's all they got left, you know, because yeah. Soler, you know, Soler is gone. So we'll see. You know, you got to play the games and and see what happens. But uh, I my feeling is by the time they get to Arizona on Thursday at home that they could straighten out this record a little bit. Uh, some news in, in baseball, uh, Spencer Strider, Bruce, out for the year. How about that? Yeah, you know, you hear these things, and it, it happens with such 
alarming mm. uh, regularity that it's it's like well what are they going to do you know i mean it's uh, it's it's the the epidemic of pitchers injuries has been going on for years it's it's nothing that's sudden but you know in that case it's it's a huge loss for them and uh, just looking into what they might do, they've you know, they got Bryce Elder was an All Star last year. He's in Triple A right now. Uh, they've got a kid in Double A. I saw some video clips of him named Hurston Waldrep, who's f- <laughs> phenomenal stuff. I mean, you know, do they bring him up? I mean, they've they've got you know they're the Braves. They they they're gonna they're gonna do it, and it it won't be. It won't be painful, I, I don't think so. But it'll be interesting. You, you lose your ace pitch, you'd be like Webb going out for the year. It was a big blow. Yeah, yeah, it, but you know something, I, I looked at the batting uh, leaders, you know, we love to do this on Sunday, and I'm just going to run through a couple with you to show you it's two weeks of a baseball season, and how many of these players will be in, in the leaders when we talk about this in September. Leading the, the majors in hitting is Ryan McMahon of Colorado, <laughs> 393. Second is Stephen Kwan of Hayward, three three eighty one. <laughs> uh, Terang of uh, Milwaukee, 372. Steer of Cincinnati, 367. And Ohapi of the Angels, 366. How about that? Yeah, that's that's radically weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's two weeks. You know, where where are the where are the big guns up there? But uh, that yeah. that's pretty funny. But you know, we always talk about we we miss those seeing those Sunday averages in the paper. You can always find them. But you, know, you pick up the Sunday paper and they got every everybody's batting average there sitting in front of you. You can spend spend an hour looking at that thing. I love it. And the RBI leaders. This is actually interesting. Guriel of Arizona. Now we'll see him for four, coming in Thursday. Uh, 18, and Steer of Cincinnati. Cincinnati's playing some good ball. Lodolo is their, their, one of their aces. He p- came back yesterday, first game in about a year and a half, and, and threw a one-hitter for six innings. So Steer, 18. Ozuna is really, ca- believe it or not, Ozuna's carrying the Braves right now, 17. And this Teoscar Hernandez of the Dodgers, 17. Bet 16 and Taylor Ward of the Angels 16. So that's a little bit more predictable, I think. Yeah, I think those are guys that are going to stay up there. Uh, Guriel had a big homer for Arizona last night. That was a huge thing that they yeah. re-signed him and brought him back because he's just a really good hitter. The Gur- whole Guriel family is full of great hitters. And Ozuna's kind of taken Soler's place as a, as a big bet in that stacked lineup. You know, it's, it's all you need after you see Olsen and Riley mm-hmm. and Acuna, and then this guy's going crazy. Uh, you know, Teoscar Hernandez has been a – He's been a good a good fit uh, for the Dodgers. Interesting play last night. He was on third, and there's a fly ball to shallow left, and uh, Profar's out there. There'd always been a big deal about Profar and and uh, Gavin Stone. He almost had you know the benches emptied, and and uh, they sent they sent Teoscar on this guy's arm, and and Profar didn't get it done. You know that's a little weakness for the Padres there. But you know uh, Teoscar Hernandez, he just. <laughs> When you've got Otani and Betts and Freeman and every, everybody else, Lux and and you know the, 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 that whole that whole and Muncie, I mean, Teoscar is in a great situation there. He's going to do some damage. You know, I'll tell, I'll tell you, let's do home runs. Then I want to come back to what you just said. Alonzo uh, O'Neill of the Red Sox six. Uh, Ozuna's got six. Trout has six, and Mookie Betts has six. So that's a little bit more of the, the stars of the game. Well, I, I'm glad to see Trout up there. You know, he's he's so loyal to the Angels, and it, it it really doesn't make a lot of sense, except that loyalty is a good thing in any business. You know, it really is. It, if you have somebody you, you can count on, he's still is he still the is he still the best player in the game? He he might be. He, he looks the, he looks the part an awful lot, and it's good to see him off to a good start. He had the wrist injury last year, and he never seemed to be able to play. And the team's going south, and Otani's about to leave, and. I, I, I think I always thought in Trout's mind he's thinking, you know, I, I got a, I need to change the scene here, but I don't. He might think that to himself, but he's he's always in the lineup when they show up at your ballpark. Yeah, and so I, I like Alonzo six. He had two yesterday mm-hmm. uh, for the Mets, so we got to see him uh, a week from Monday uh, when the Met when the Mets come in. Um, but going back to what you said about the Dodgers. You know, and I said this before, I can't wait to see a three-game series between the Dodgers and the Giants. And the, and the Giants run Webb out there and Snell out there and Hicks or Harrison. 
and uh, Bobby Miller, who knows about his shoulder, if he'll be back, and Yamamoto gets whacked around again by the Padres. <laughs> um, and, you know, Paxton goes tonight, who handled uh, the Giants pretty well, and Glasnow did as well. But I think the Giants can play toe-to-toe with the Dodgers. I really do. Yeah, well, I, I do too. I mean, they, obviously they have to pitch. You know, the lineup's not going to yeah. measure up n- night to night, right. but they have to pitch. Um, and who knows? The Giants could get, you know, f- five consecutive great starts from those five guys. Yeah. Why not? They've all yeah. showed, you know, B- Snell is just now starting to come on, but he's, I'm not worried about him at all. Wynn was very good uh, the other night. Um, got some strikeouts with his best pitches, and it was a tough, tough loss. Uh, they didn't score for him, but, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, Gavin Stone pitched for the Dodgers last night. He had five perfect innings going against the Padres in a high-profile game, and looked like a pretty tough kid. He had a perfect game going, and Profar fakes a bunt. <laughs> with only, <laughs> only one like nothing, that. only a one nothing game. Now, to me. Why not? Why not drop a bunt? It's it's a one run game, and he can run a little bit. Next thing you know, he he, he scores, and it's one to one. But the Dodgers uh, no. took issue with it, and then the next pitch was inside. But I, I liked it from Stone. I think he he wouldn't have mind hitting pro far if it was a five run lead. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was uh, he he's he's uh, Stone looks like a pretty tough kid, and they need him with with Miller out of there. But uh, you, know, you know, let's see uh, Yamamoto and Snell. You know, that's, it's, it's, the matchups are, could be fascinating. I'm telling you, I swear that we've got action here, and it's only mm-hmm. 15 games in, but I'm I'm starting to get a feel for what this ball club can can look like, and I like the way Bob Melvin is handling them. I really yeah, do. Absolutely. Uh, Kansas City wins uh, yesterday over the Mets, and of course, who knows? I got to look at the schedule to see when Kansas City and the Giants play. Who knows where they'll be by then? But they've got the best run differential in the uh, in the American League right now, and Sal Perez. And I'll get on that bandwagon again. we I've been saying it for years, Bruce. This guy is a, to me. He's a Hall of Famer, and he hit another oh, home yeah. run yesterday. Yeah, yeah. He every day he he he's like Yadier Molina. You know he. The older it gets, uh, he he just never he never loses the the presence. Uh, you know, the, he's a team captain kind of guy. He's still delivering. He's a good defensive catcher. You know, the, uh, the Kansas City's playing really well. He handles the pitching staff. But whenever Kansas City comes in, go out there to the park, not just for him, but to see Bobby Witt. Uh, this guy is such a for real talent. He's he's absolutely one of the best best players in the game already. Bobby Witt Jr. He's a heck of a shortstop. He hits the ball like crazy. The other night he had a he had a had a play where he he kind of cut in front of the second baseman to make a play, and the second baseman, the Lofton, thinking, "Oh my God, we're going to have a collision here." And Lofton leap up in the air, and Wood Wood made the play with the with the second baseman flying over his head <laughs> and kicking him in the in the kicking him in the head, not 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 direct contact, but he he made the play, and they both had a good laugh out of it, but. Uh, I'm watching Kansas City just just for wit. I'm telling you, this kid is just magic. Yeah, too bad we don't get him here. Uh, the Giants yeah. play. In, I was just looking at okay, the schedule. All right. I got my my big schedule. I'll put it on the stream here. I got my big schedule here. <laughs> uh, Kansas City, uh, September twentieth, uh, three game series. Who knows that may? You know, the end of this uh, schedule. Listen to this. I just happened to look at it. You get uh, this is from September thirteenth on. You get San Diego. The Orioles for three, Kansas City for three, Kansas City may be trouble, Arizona for three, and then the Cardinals for three at home. That's that's quite a finish. Yeah, it's it's, it's a strange one, too. I, I'm never in favor of um, all of a sudden you're playing the American League in September. You know, if you're in a race, but Kansas City's here? You know, we're the Padres <laughs> or the Diamondbacks or the Dodgers. Uh, but, uh, you know, Kansas City uh, on the road, uh just for just as as we were talking about, that's a fun team to watch. And in the Orioles, oh my goodness! They the other the other night they their first five hitters were all first round draft picks. Mm. You, know, you got Rutschman and Henderson and you know, Jackson Holiday, and uh, they they just keep coming, and they're all really really good. They're a very fun team to watch. And you get Burns today against mm-hmm. the Brewers, uh, his former team. So you got uh, Burns going against the Orioles today. Uh, that's that's one to watch. That'll be a good mm-hmm. one. That'll be a good one today. Um, the uh, guy for the Cubs. Did you see him? Imanaga. Uh, yeah. The, the he, lefty. Come on. How about him? Yeah, you're talking about Otani and 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 uh, Yamamoto and some other good pitchers coming over from Asia. But this guy, 
Yeah, I don't think he's allowed an earned run yet. They're running him out there for like five, six innings, but he's got right. three starts now without allowing an earned run. Yep. And they're gonna, you know, they ramp him up to seven or eight. Who knows? He, he could, he could be an ace. He, he, he looks really good. He's, he's not uh, having any trouble with major league hitters so far. I haven't really l- looked at him in a, you know, extended look at him, uh, but the, the numbers are terrific so far. Yeah, throw strikes. Uh, yeah, yeah, throw strikes, low hits, and all that stuff. And uh, the Cubs beat Seattle. Seattle just can't hit at all. Uh, so they they beat Seattle last night. One last thing for you. Uh, Rod Carew was in the news, and mm-hmm. uh, did you see this? He wanted to yeah. be a hit, hitting coach for the Angels, and Artie Moreno won't let him because he also uh, is a consultant for the Twins, and uh, he said, well, you can't do that. We we can't have you around. How about that? Well, yeah, I, I love it. Any negative publicity for Artie Moreno, and I know some Angel fans who feel extremely strong about this, and they couldn't believe that he announced that he was going to sell the team, and then, uh, then he didn't. Well, he had pulled back for another 10 years of horrible play. I mean, you know, the, how much can the owner do? Well, you know, he doesn't play the game, but when you have a real negative feeling around the owner and around the A's, they're they're leading the, the world in that for all time. But um, he's not a good guy. He, he pretends to be, but this is a guy uh, who stifled their Spanish-speaking network. This is a guy from Mexico, Artie Moreno, Mexican heritage. Um, you know, he's got the Spanish-speaking broadcasters in an apartment in Whittier. You know, might as well be. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just just pathetic stuff. And they botched the Otani thing really badly last year. And uh, he's 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 not a good good guy. He's got to go. I love Carew speaking out. This is a he's not an all-time Angel. He's an all-time Twin. But he did play for the Angels, and he likes. He yeah. liked what he what he felt about the team then, and that at that time, geez, they were stacking up Gritch and Reggie Jackson and uh, unbelievable lineup. Uh, but you know now he just wants to sort of be part of it, and they're rejecting him. You know, yeah. perfect, perfect yeah. angels. Yeah, because he he was a consultant with the Twins. So I said, well, that's a conflict of interest. Come on, are you kidding me? Baseball's yeah. got conflicts all over the place. And, uh, oh my goodness! Yeah, you know, to do that to Rod Crew, not not good. But that's uh, you're right. That that's the way the Angels uh, do it. Well, I I'm looking forward to Snell today. I really am. Oh, I yeah. hope, uh, you know, I don't know what kind of crowds they get. Uh, I don't know if they'll get more than seventeen thousand today or twelve thousand. But uh, he's coming back to a place where he did win a Cy Young. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, they they have. Uh... I'm sure those fans have good memories of him. I mean, when he started, you know, broke in with them, people are going, man, this this kid is really has has good stuff. As we were talking about, I mean, that's not a it's not a great lineup. But it's it's early for Snell. He he might not be 100% uh, ready to throw his best, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he just dominates those guys. Yeah, and this is not the Tampa Bay of uh, of your fathers, as we like to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's or not, certainly not my a, grandfather. <laughs> not at all. Come on. <laughs> all right, have a great Sunday. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks a lot, Marty. All right, have a good good Sunday. The professor, Ron Wotus, is next right here on the Sports Leader. Just like baseball, Georgie Brothers Furniture is full of tradition as they've served the Bay Area for over 90 years. Still a third-generation family-owned furniture showroom. Their talented staff work as a team to help their customers select the best pieces of furniture to invest in. The 50,000-square-foot showroom is full of over 150 wonderful manufacturers. One of the most popular furniture lines I love and own is Stressless Chairs. Stressless makes all kind of high-quality furniture, including sectionals, sofas, love seats, single reclining chairs, as well as the classic Stressless Chair and Ottoman. Now, starting March 29th and running all the way through May 28th, there is a great sale on Stressless Furniture right here at Georgie Brothers. Visit the Stressless Gallery today. You'll find something that you love. That's Georgie Brothers in South San Francisco since 1933. 
the best source for home furnishings, or visit them at georgiebrothers.com. That's G-I-O-R-G-I-B-R-O-S.com. Remember, tell them that Marty sent you. All right, great to have you back with us as we bring in the professor, Ron Wotus. Whoa, well, how are you? Good to hear from you, Marty. I'm doing <laughs> great, and so are you. I was listening to a little bit of the show here while I was getting cleaned up up here in Sacramento, um, getting ready for another 1 o'clock game over here uh, with the River Cats, but uh, enjoying the show this morning. Good. Uh, what's going on with the Cats up there? Uh, anything that uh, you can report on? Well, you know, I, I, your fans maybe don't want to hear this, but they had much better weather in Augusta yesterday than they did over <laughs> here in Sacramento. 
I mean, the game last night, uh, it rained all day. Uh, they were fortunate to get it in. They were delayed. They started at 730, uh, played the game, played a nice game. You know, I like this team up here. Um, you, you look at the personnel they have, the pitching staff, the position players. They have a little bit of youth. Um, and they and they have some guys that have been in AAA for a couple of years. And I just chose the strength of the depth uh, with the organization. You know, I think there's a lot more stability to the major league club. And it's going to be here. So some of these guys, you know, are going to have to put up the numbers. They're going to have to do it for a while, you know, barring injuries. And, you know, that's a good thing for the players to develop and, and put together solid months or years uh, or year and um, show what they can do. Well, the one everyone asks about is Luciano. What do you see with him? Well, he's getting better. You know, Marco, uh, he, he's very coachable. Uh, he's a hard worker. You know, I've really enjoyed working with him over the years, before, you know, for those two things. You know, some guys can be aloof or the communication barrier could get a little difficult at times, but he's always engaged, and that's what I like. And the kid wants to be a player. Um, you know, defensively, he's getting better. He's, he's, made, he's made huge strides. And at the plate, you know, at the plate, he's, he's keeping his average up right now. He's not hitting for power. But, you know, like a lot of guys that are here, they still have uh, rough ed- edges that they have to smooth out if they want to be a consistent major league player. And that's where those reps in the games played. Let them find out who they are, what kind of player they need to be to be successful. And you need at-bats, you need games played to find that out. Boy, Fitzgerald's in the lineup today, Whoa, uh, playing short. Uh, Ahmed gets a day off. But we said it last Sunday, turn them loose. And they turned them <laughs> loose this week. I loved it. Come on, he had three stolen bases Wednesday. He ran like crazy. I mean, uh, he, I don't know if Matt Williams tried to stop him, but he kept running. Uh, he was thrown out at the plate. What about the week of uh, Tyler Fitzgerald? Yeah, I was uh, real pleased to see him in there and have that day that he did because his first start it was only his second start the game you're referring to of the season and you know you're a triple a player you're used to playing every single day and then you get to the big leagues of course he had a cup of coffee last year and played sporadically so it wasn't his first time having to deal with that but you know you want to get some at bats you want to get in the groove and when your first game isn't so good and then you wait 10 days you know, you hope that he has a good game to settle in, take a deep breath, and uh, and relax a little bit because you could start pressing. But he has the skills. Um, he showed his speed, what he can do, and the thing that uh, I was impressed with, you know, I heard him say it. He says he's ready for the moment. He wanted to do something. He wanted to make an impact. So I like that type of attitude that uh, he's not tentative. He's not unsure of himself. He knows what he can do, and he wanted to do it. So – Good day for him, and uh, I think he's going to be in the game again today. So it'll be nice to see him getting uh, more reps at the major league level to keep the other guys fresh because he can play multiple positions. And, you know, he'll he'll enhance that club uh, if he gets uh, gets some reps where he feels comfortable and consistent. Well, he tried to score from second on a ground ball to the infield, and he kept going. Uh, And he was thrown out at the plate, and I guess he ran through the stop sign. My question to you is, do you have guys run through the stop sign when you were coaching third? What what happened? Uh, one or two. I usually ended up in AAA, but uh, <laughs> not a joke. <laughs> but, you know, it, it happens on, at times. Some guys have their heads down. You know, they want to score so bad. Um, it shouldn't happen a lot. You know, that's where you sometimes you got to scream at them, too. You can't just put your arms up. You see his head down, you start screaming at him, stop, stop. <laughs> and uh, it happens. Um you know, well, that's a play that you, you try to do as well as a third base coach. And I don't know if Matty sent him or if he went on his own. You said he ran through the stop sign. But, you know, anytime you have a man on second base with really, really good speed and there's a ball, usually if it's a ground ball up the middle to the backhand of the second baseman or deep to the shortstop, it's a long throw to first. And that guy gets a good jump at second base and has that type of speed you can try to send them and keep them going. You know, especially if you have a lead, it's a fun play for a third base coach. And a lot of times uh, the first baseman, especially if it's a left-handed first baseman, has to turn all the, re- all the way around to make that throw home. It takes another half second to execute. It's a fun play uh, to score a run on, but this, the man at second has to have really, really good speed. Yeah, Fitzgerald has it. I mean, he, well, he's quick. He is quick. Yeah. There's no question. And he stole a big bag the other day as well. 
uh, at a critical point. So he's in there today. So I'm glad that uh, that we pushed for that, and uh, I'm glad he's in there today. Uh, Giants hit five home runs yesterday. Soler hit one, just crushed one. Estrada hit a couple, hit very hard. Uh, Wade hit one. Chapman hit one. What about this ballpark? Is this a home run ballpark? You know, I, I think the ball carries pretty good there. I mean, I remember guys almost hitting the catwalks years ago, right? Is are they going to yeah. hit the catwalk up there? So, um, you know, but Pat Burrell would know a lot better than me. He popped a few out of there over the years. But, uh, you know what, I, I think just you're seeing, you know, guys come around. Uh, Estrada, Solaire, um, you know, they haven't been swinging the way they're capable. And, you know, it's only been a couple of weeks. And uh, as you always say, Marty, it's a long season. It's the ebb and flow of the season. So it's nice to see the offense getting started. Well, you mentioned Burrell. Uh, boy, well, Tampa Bay let him go. Remember that? And uh, and you yeah. guys picked him up. Boy, and he walked in and he became a player right away for the Giants. He became a player. He became a leader. Um, he brought a lot of energy and, and competitiveness to the club, just like Jack Peavy did when he came over. You know, you need those guys in the clubhouse to stir it up. And, and you know, just like, you know, I, I think of uh, uh, Bob Melvin getting thrown out. You know, he didn't make a big scene, but, you know, the team's not playing good. I thought it was a well-timed ejection for him. You know, you're not playing the way you're capable. You know, they're all handling it like professionals. There's no panic. But, you know, hey, you know, this is important, and, and Bo Mel stuck up for his players, and, you know, the players see that, and, they, you know, that, that, that helps the group say, hey, you know what, yeah, well, we need to start winning some games. Um, you know, everybody cares about this. So, you know, Pat was one of those guys. P was one of those guys, and, of course, Bo Mel, I thought it was a well-timed ejection the other day. You know, uh, you've done this many times when uh, Dusty got thrown out or uh, Boach got thrown out, and you had to take over uh, and uh, – you know, become the manager. Ryan Christensen had to do it the other day. What's it like uh, having to do that? Do you, do you look over your shoulder or do you just take over the game? Well, you know, it dep depends on the manager. You know, the other previous managers, you know, Dusty and, and Felipe, I just always took over. But there was the first couple of games when Boach <clears throat> got thrown out. Um, he did try to relay some information to me. And, uh, you know, the infamous game that Tim Flannery talks about where Boach got thrown out, you know, by Gary Darling, and then I got thrown out, and Flan had to manage the game. <laughs> Flan tells a great story how Boach was trying to relay him information, and I won't get to the punchline of that, but I know your fans have probably heard that. But, uh, you know, and then after a couple of days, a couple of games like that, he, you know, he, he just let me do my thing once, once you get to know each other. But, um, it's, you know, it's not the easiest, and I'll tell you why. You know, you, you, you're, not, you're not in the groove to maybe giving the signs to, catch, to the catcher. You're not in the groove of working the bullpen. You know, you have a good pitching coach. Of course, we had rags, so a good pitching coach is in your ear helping you. Hey, I'm going to get so-and-so up. You know, that's what you want your coaches to do, to take care of their area for you. So, you know, if something slips your mind, you're thinking about, you know, the offense or something and, you know, the pitcher's having an issue, they, they can foresee what's going to happen. Now, you do that as a manager, too, but when you're not doing that every day and all of a sudden, you know, two months, you're, you're managing the game and, and, you know, the mechanics of that, the timing of it, you're just not in tune with it. But it comes back quick. I mean, if you've managed in the minor leagues like I have, it, it only takes a – you know, four or five innings and you start getting in the groove again. But uh, it, it's fun, but it can be a little bit difficult at first because of you're not used to doing those things. And now, boom, you, you got to manage the whole club right then and there. Yeah, well, he put uh, Fitzgerald in and he had him run right away. I like that. So, uh, you know, that that's what he did. And uh, I thought it was a good good time to do it. There, there's yeah. an incident in the Dodger game last night, and uh, this is – you know, it's great. I don't think hitters know how to get out of the way, well, of an inside pitch. You know that? Well, I think I think it's changed quite a bit. And you know, nobody pitches inside anymore. And if, if you come close, you know, you cover a couple inches of the player, he's, he's falling backwards like, you, you know, you just hit him in the neck or something. I mean, <laughs> the, the, you know, they're so sensitive to it. But years ago, as you know, the great Bob Gibson and you know, Nolan Ryan and guys, you didn't want to look at those guys wrong and, you know, Four guys and get someone big guy would hit a home run. A little guy came up. He got drilled. It was just the way the game was. So I think they're 
they're a lot more uh, comfortable in the box is probably the right word. You know, they can lean out over there on that outside corner. You don't see a lot of pitchers pitching in. And, and when it happens today, it's more because of the lack of command, in my opinion, than it is as a purpose pitch. And, um, you know, as a hitter, if you use both sides of the plate, you back somebody off the plate, it's a lot more uncomfortable hitting, especially with the stuff the guys have today. So I think you're right. I think guys are comfortable in the box. Um, they're, they're staying in there, and they're not used to dealing with the ball coming at them. You know, this Gavin Stone uh, retired the first 15 last night for the Dodgers, and Bruce Jenkins was talking about it, that uh, Profar faked a bunt. And it's a one nothing game at this point. So is it? can you do that? Or is it bad form? A perfect game and you're trying to lay one down. Uh, it was a close game at that point. Remember Ben Davis with the Phillies did that uh, to the Padres? Uh, right. And there was a big stink about that. Maybe it was Randy Johnson. I forget who. But what's the protocol with that? What do you think? Well, that's a tough one, Marty. You never know. You don't know what that guy in the mound's going to feel. You don't know what that other team's going to feel like. Um, I know what I feel like in that moment. And I remember being a defensive coach and running the infield. And, uh, you know, my biggest fear was that the third baseman was going to be back. And uh, if it's a close game, if the game's out of hand, I think the protocol is you you don't bunt. But if the, the game is, is winnable, I think as an offense – you do what you have to do to win the game. I mean, that's what we're there for. We're there to win the game. So, um, you know, I, 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 my biggest fear as I get back to it was that, you know, the third baseman is going to just stay back and, uh, you know, give a guy a bunt, and you don't know what the hitter's thinking. So if it's a close enough game, I would always keep him up. And you wouldn't feel good about it either, Marty, because now you're, you're keeping him up for the bunt, and the guy hits one by him, and he gets a hit. And everybody, you know, half the country saying, what's he doing defending the bunt? No one's going to bunt, you know, in a perfect game, to your point. So I, I don't think there's, a, you know, people are going to agree, agree completely on how you play that. But I know what I did as a coach when I was defending it, and I know how I felt about it as a minor league manager trying to win a baseball game or a coach in the big leagues. We're there to win the game. So I, I, I think it's all, all fair game at that point in time if you're trying to win the game. Is there still a lot of chirping from the dugout? I know we've covered this over the years. Is it going away, you know, to bench jockeying or anything like that where you, where you actually yell at another player? Is that Does that happen yeah. again? Yeah, you know, I've I've been out of the dugout now for a couple of years. Um, you know, you, you get a little bit. It, it's certain teams, it's certain players, but I think, I think in general, that you know, the players get along um, more today than they they did before. The ri- the rivalry isn't always as difficult. I think a lot of players have the same agents. Um, fraternization is something. Remember years ago. The umpires would fine you if you're talking to the other team yeah. before the game. I mean, what kind of rule was that? And I today, like it. you like it. <laughs> you're a competitor, Marty. You're from New York. I you like want to win the game. Yes. You don't want to do that. But that's all. That's all gone. And I think that you know, I lend the hand for everybody being friendlier. Um, I said they have the same agents. Uh, you know, players change hands a lot more today than they did years ago. So you have a lot of friends on the other side um, that you may have played with. So I think those dynamics have changed it quite a bit. And I don't, I don't think there's as much chirping from dugouts and, you know, uh, will ill towards the other team than there probably was years ago. Yep. I miss it. I do. Frank Robinson always was the best at that. So yeah, uh, I don't talk to anybody. I'm, I'm here to win the game. That's, <laughs> that's, right. that's the deal. All right. We're going to let you run. Well, I want to do a little tribute to Jackie Robinson, which is tomorrow is April 15th. So uh, we have Rachel Robinson coming up and a little bit with Jason Hayward talking about Jackie. So I want to get that done. So enjoy Sacramento and we'll talk to you next week. Marty, great being with you. Enjoy the game today. All right, take care. And that is the Professor Ron Wotus. All right, more coming up right here, KMBR 680, 104.5, the sports leader. Thank you.
Fans for great baseball gear, check out Baseballism. The store is located at 3rd and King opposite the ballpark. Whether it's jackets, shirts, hats, you name it, Baseballism is the most unique store I've seen. It is the best. 3rd and King, right opposite the ballpark. Sound right, boy. Hi, Marty Lurie here, Jason Hayward. April 15th, a special day for me. I saw him play in Brooklyn. That's Jackie Robinson. But uh, we celebrate Jackie and his legacy on April 15th. What does that mean to you? It means to me that his dream, his sacrifices, uh, the things he went through to be able to play this game at a high level have paid off tremendously. And uh, to me, those gifts keep on giving in our communities, um, in our clubhouses, now you see coaching staffs, uh, just, just the overall diversity of people being able to enjoy this game year in and year out. How did you learn about Jackie? Uh, my parents actually got me a book, uh, a couple books on Jackie Robinson. And those were probably the first two, three books that I read in my life on my own. Um, so just learning about him, uh, learning about him being born in Georgia, going to, going to UCLA, playing multiple sports there. Um, even learning a little bit about his brother, that he he was the one that came in, in second place running against Jesse Owens. Um, there's a lot of cool history in that, but, um, you know, a lot, a lot of inspiration. Uh, but just, again, you know, being 33 years old now, um, you know, from when I was a kid reading that book for the first time, a lot of appreciation because you, you understand how hard it is um, today just to make it, um, you know, no matter what walk of life, right, no matter what ethnicity. But... For, for the time he had to do it with so many other elements to kind of have to look past different variables on the on a day daily basis like to me very very impressive oh, great knowledge good knowledge of jackie robinson to me it's uh what he had to put up with on the field and in the clubhouse that, and plus play major league baseball at the highest level how about that yeah, that's uh, you know, that's you know what I'm getting at as far as like the different variables on a daily basis. You know, we all have families. Uh, you know, some of us have kids. Uh, you know, we we had to spend time away from them. You know, our our immediate families, our parents, things like that. Uh, you know, there's always something that can go, you know, not our way off the field. Uh, you know, clubhouse wise, you're with your teammates from spring training to the end of the year. You know, you don't always get along, but in, in that sense, you know, dealing with race, that's that's got to be tough. That's that's got to be something that just grinds you down. And to go out there and you know, love the game, but also love what you're doing it for. Um, you know, to me, it's it's putting a lot of other people first before yourself, and, and that's super commendable. Mm. Do you have a 42 jersey? Do I have a 42 jersey? Well, a Brooklyn Dodger maybe, 42 jersey, a Jackie jersey? I don't have a Brooklyn Dodger one because I haven't played for the Dodgers <laughs> yet. Um, I I want to say I may have had a Jackie jersey 
when I was younger, but I, I'm not sure where it is now. I think it had like a few T-shirts. That's what it was. Okay. I had the T-shirts and then the banners that you would put up sure. in the room. Yeah. I had a few of those um, that were Jackie. A lot of different ones there, but this will be the first year I get to wear it at 42. Cool. Very good, Jason. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. My good. pleasure. Thank you, Marty. Boy, that was a lot of fun. Jason Hayward's got a 42 Dodger jersey now, I'll tell you that. Uh, Bridge Bank offers financing solutions to businesses for their working capital, equipment, and real estate needs. Fred Voss is the Senior Managing Director of Bridge Bank's commercial lending efforts in Northern California. He has commercial banking teams in San Jose with Jesse Garcia, San Francisco, Oakland, Chito, Cordova, and in Pleasanton. Bridge Bank, it's like being with a friend when you go into Bridge Bank, which is really nice. I like that. Uh, more coming up. Let's see. We've got Rachel Robinson. And, uh, you know, I like to do the tribute to Jackie every year. Uh, it's very important to do that. And, of course, April 15th is tomorrow, uh, the debut of Jackie in 1947. But uh, the biggest thrill I had is seeing Jackie play and being at Ebbets Field and, and looking at that uniform as a kid and, and seeing him on the base paths and dancing back and forth and and just, I, I wish I understood more about him. Uh, but what, what could you know as a, as a 10-year-old at that point? But a uh, fabulous man, uh, such an important part of uh, American history, baseball history. And one of my biggest thrills was getting to talk to Rachel Robinson, his wife. And I did that. And uh, every year, Raph goes in the archives and pulls it out. And uh, this is my little conversation with Rachel Robinson. It was a, a great challenge initially and um, troubling in many ways. We had just married and we had been friends for many years. So we were partners in the uh, whole experiment and it was actually thrilling for me to be a participant and because Jack kept me close to him and, and made me a participant in it. The tough times were very difficult, frustrating, but I want people to remember that we also had great triumphs. And some of the most exciting things that could happen to an individual happened to us. Jack won all the honors that baseball gives. He won all the civil rights honors. He really was rewarded in his lifetime. So he was not a martyr. Initially, people were quiet, but remember there were black fans there for the first time. So Jack had that kind of support coming from the stands. And shortly thereafter, the white fans in Brooklyn, when they found out he could help the team, then they were on his side. And uh, Brooklyn was special. Brooklyn was um, a mix of people anyway, ethnic groups and that kind of thing. So there was a kind of warmth in Ebbets Field that you did not experience in the other parks. He was such a great, intense competitor. And to see the uh, film on TV of him dancing off third base, the slide at home with Yogi Berra, did you enjoy watching him play as a competitor? Oh. Oh, absolutely. I was one his number one fan. In fact, when he would get in arguments with the umpire and I would think he was going to get kicked out of the game, I'd start sending all these telepathic messages, you know, because I just thought the team wasn't good without him, you know. So I did enjoy watching him play a lot. He was a man who instantly bridled at injustice long before he got into baseball. In the Army at UCLA, he did not let things go by that he didn't like. So it was difficult, but he had a very instantly good relationship with Branch Rickey, and they had a pact between them. And it wasn't that Ricky dictated, but he cautioned him about what was going to happen, and they joined each other in a very special way. And Jack said for a time-limited period, he could restrain himself. He could not have agreed to that for the life of his playing days. I mean, it wasn't possible. But so much was riding on his success at restraining himself, particularly for our people. He was able to do that. How frustrating was it for him to come home at night after some of those games where he had to look the other way with the umpires, the other players and fans? Well... For one thing, I went to every home game, and we rode back together. So there was a lot of debriefing that went on in the car, coming back. And then if he got home, he was a person who felt that you didn't bring anger into the house. You didn't bring the troubles into the house. So he uh, tried very hard to get rid of all that before he got home so that he could really enjoy his home. If he got home and he was still angry, he'd go out and hit a bucket of golf balls. I mean, you know, I mean, he had ways, but he just would not allow himself to uh, to create tension in the household. 
I think he felt, and I, I certainly feel, that he was one of the catalysts for the civil rights movement. And that before uh, Brown versus Board of Education, before uh, Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, Jack was out there on the front lines and experiencing a lot of these things. And he was alerting the white population to the effects of discrimination, that it's a loss for all of us, that, that nobody wins when people are excluded. So that I feel that, that he was a part of the movement from the very beginning. What was exciting for him was to see leadership emerge and have people to join, like Dr. King, Jesse Jackson, others that he admired so much. So, yes, the Civil Rights Movement was incredibly important to him. When he was in the Army, there was nothing he could do about segregation except to complain. But once the movement started, you have a revolution on your hands, and you have something to join, and you have organizations that will have a strategy like the civil disobedience movement. So it was it was very exciting part of his life. Well, I've been doing this for 29 years, and Raf knows it uh, interviewed probably 10,000 people. That's the best. This is my favorite. This is my favorite one, to hear Rachel Robinson talking about Jackie. It feels like I'm there. Um, so that's my best. Uh, Ron Rosenblum, uh, the late Ron Rosenblum, put that together for us and edited it. Uh, Raf gets it out there every year, and I'm very happy to be able to do that and very proud to do it. Uh, she tells the story. Rachel really tells the story of what Jackie was all about and what he went through. So that's the best I've got. Of all the ones I've I've done, that's the best I've got. So, Raf, thank you for doing that. I'm very happy to do the live streaming. This is fun. Austin Scott and Michael Connell and Raf uh, got it together. I guess I can see myself. Uh, if you're just tuning in, uh, it, it gets archived at uh, YouTube at the KNBR live stream. And uh, it's all one continuous run of, of the pregame of today. And Walter's coming up, and he'll be on there as well. So it's been a lot of fun to do this. I like it. I hope you like it. Um, it is our Original Joe's contest today uh, at Baseball Marty. Just guess the score of the game, and uh, you can win dinner for two at Original Joe's, and Raph will take care of that later on today. He breaks all ties randomly. Uh, the lineup today for the Giants against the opener, Sean Armstrong, and then probably a lefty after that. It's Lee Flores at first, Wade in right, uh, Soler the DH, Chapman at third, Conforto in left, Estrada at second, Murphy doing the catching, and my guy, Tyler Fitzgerald, is at short today. And let's see if he can run on uh, Rene Pinto, who's doing the catching for Tampa today. Back with you next Saturday, 9 a.m. Have a good day, everybody. Walter coming up next right now with our Giants pregame. What's up, Giants fans, and good morning. It's a little early today. I had to, I had to rush into the studio. But the Giants, I'm still waking up. The Bats have finally woken up in St. Petersburg. Yesterday, five home runs from the Giants offense. We'll talk about that. But welcome to the Giants warm-up show. I'm your host, Walter. You called to say that, taking you all the way to first pitch of the rubber match between the Giants and and the Tampa Bay Rays, which uh, the start time has changed. It was originally set for 10.40. Uh, it is now a, a first pitch of 11 o'clock, so we'll take you all the way up to first pitch for uh, for the Giants. We got Blake Snell returning to the Trop for the first time today uh, as a visitor, and the Rays are going to go with Sean Armstrong, which is, uh, <laughs> can, I, can I say uh, proudly, happily, that uh, the days of the Giants going an opener are over. <laughs> when you look at uh, what they got with with Keaton Wynn early in the in the series, then Logan Webb just a a, a, a web gem, if you will, uh, yesterday really set the tone for the San Francisco Giants. Uh, and now you just keep it rolling. You keep it rolling with 
the uh, with the, with the pitching staff with this starting rotation. You kind of see glimpses of what this rotation can be moving forward uh, into the season. You got Blake Snell going out there for his second start uh, in the orange and black. His first one didn't go as ideal as you would want. He only went 72 pitches, went three innings. Uh, ball got lost in the in in the sun for Jung Hoo Lee and and uh, his fastball. He really just didn't have control over that. So we'll we'll like to see where uh, where Blake Snell is in this game uh, because you have to remember Blake Snell. He is still kind of ramping up, right? Uh, he start he's he signed late in the spring, and this essentially is his his spring training. So uh, we'd like to see him go a little deeper. I know that he would like to go a little deeper. Uh, so we'll have to see where that where that comfortability is with him returning to to the trop. I mean, that's just a, a remarkable, uh, you know, situation for him, just be able to go back to his roots, go back to where uh, where it all started for, for Blake Snell, uh, and he won a Cy Young there as well. So he has faced this Tampa Bay Rays team before. Um, last year was the first time, first and only time, uh, that he pitched against his former team, uh, and it, it was stellar in, in San Diego. I believe it was uh, it was in June where he pitched against his former team. He had 12 strikeouts, gave up two hits, shut out ball of six innings. So uh, can we see something similar? Maybe not. Maybe not as dominant because I mean you got to remember he's still ramping up. This is essentially his spring training. But I would like to see five. I'd like to see four or five uh, out of Blake Snell and and the bullpen is rested. That's what happens when the starting rotation does what it does and what they are capable of doing. Keaton Wynn, uh, really that five spot, he has been pet- pitching way better than a a five pitcher. Uh, you look at his record, 0-3, we've talked about it before, his ERA above five. The numbers don't look good, but, but he has been pitching much better than his numbers suggest. Then you follow that up with Logan Webb, who is just lights out, electric, a bulldog on the mound. You'd love to see that from your ace, and that just sets the tone, and then it just continues to turn over. And now you go to your your ace uh, 1B, right, the, in, in Blake Snell, and that's who's pitching today for the San Francisco Giants. Uh, but we will get more on the pitching staff and how you're feeling. 808-KMBR is the number, 415-808-5627. Go ahead and give us a call. You want to chime in on the Giants offense, which we will get to uh, in a sec. But uh, if you want to talk about the Giants offense, they, they came alive yesterday, five home runs. Everyone kind of strung it together. And is this the Giants offense that we can expect to see moving forward? Because everyone was really pressing uh, Bob Melvin goes out there, gets the ejection, gets the team fired up, lets them know that he is in their corner. And I think that him trotting out the same lineup every single day, it just it, it's paying it's paying off. It's paying dividends because he is not giving up on his guys. So uh, that's that's crucial uh, in, in today's game of baseball where everybody focuses on analytics. And I just love what I'm seeing from Lamont Wade Jr. and and Tyro Estrada really stringing it together. He's he's probably uh, one of the two hottest pl- hottest hitters on the Giants uh, this past week. So you got, got got guys like that, and you got Jorge Soler that is just tearing it up. But we'll get more uh, in on that. But the pitching staff also as well. How are you feeling about this pitching staff moving forward when you got Keaton Wynn, when you got Logan Webb, you got Blake Snell going today, and then we go into Miami with – with Kyle Harrison, with Jordan Hicks, and then it just turns on over to Keaton Wynn. Then they come home for a four-game series against the Arizona Diamondbacks. So how are you feeling about the Giants early on in the season? Uh, The the offense has been abysmal, but it was nice to see that they are finally waking up in Tampa Bay uh, at at the Trop. So uh, before we get more in on the Giants, I just gotta I just gotta let you guys know of uh, that we will be having an interview coming up in about uh, in, in about ten minutes, 10, 10, 12 minutes here on the Sports Leader uh, as Jackie Robinson Day. Uh, you heard some of the interviews there with Marty early on with uh, Rachel Robinson and Jason Hayward, and and it's just a great day for reflection. So as Jackie Robinson Day is tomorrow, April fifteenth, it's seventy seven years uh to the day that jackie robinson broke the color barrier and changed baseball and changed this country so uh i had the opportunity to speak with president of the negro league baseball museum bob kendrick uh previously aired on kmbr in the in the early mornings if you're if you're a kmbr head and you're up at at six seven in the morning uh on the weekends but it did air uh previously on the rounding third and king podcast i do that as well 
um, on the on the weekend, so you can check that out on the KMBR podcast page. But I'll be talking with uh, Bob Kendrick. I'm going to share that with you today, the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum, and uh, it, it's it's going to be a great conversation. I mean, I, I've done a lot of interviews in in my uh, in my time doing podcasts on the side, and and then now doing uh, doing Giants warm up and and all that kind of stuff. But this is by far the best conversation that I've that I've ever had. So I really look forward to sharing that uh, with you, Bob Kendrick, to talk and celebrate Jackie Robinson, the 77th anniversary of Jackie Robinson Day, uh, where he broke the color barrier eight uh, in, in 1947, April 15th. That's tomorrow. So we will celebrate today. But let's let's get you ready for for the Giants, uh, for the Giants and the Rays today. The Giants offense was on Full display yesterday, uh, full display, and we have most of the same guys in the lineup. There are a couple of changes. You got uh, Fitzgerald in there giving Nick Ahmed a time off. You got Bailey uh, taking a rest with with Murphy in there, but most of the same guys are in this lineup, and you start to see it coming together. Yaz isn't in the lineup today. You got uh, you got Wade Jr. in in right field. You got Flores at first, so. When you have the same cohesiveness of this offense and we saw what they are capable of doing, again, do I expect them? Do you expect them, the, the listener? Do, do you expect them, Raph, do you expect them to, to hit five home runs in, in a single day? I mean, that's just not something that is going to happen. But No, we, but but I expect five home runs a day. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> After what I saw yesterday, I'm like, no, this team can't, yeah. you know, they no. cannot hit you know, I mean, five home runs. I mean, we weren't, no one was expecting that, but dude, they could easily hit seven. I right. mean, what, what, what are we doing? Five? That's that's way too low. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> I, I at least I at least want three and maybe a ground uh, rule double. Okay, I like know, that. You know. I like that. Yeah. No. See, so when you look at this Giants team, the five home runs, it's not going to be a normal occurrence. I understand that, and we're coming off of this high, and I think we were just thirsty. I think I think Giants fans were thirsty. I was thirsty. Uh, Raph was thirsty. Everybody was thirsty for some offense. So we see this explosion of five home runs. They dropped 11 runs uh, on the the Tampa Bay Rays yesterday. Five home runs, two from Tyro Estrada, who is probably one of the one of the hottest uh, Giants right now, next to Lamont Wade Jr. Uh, they are really stringing together some solid abs. So when you look at what they are doing, and when you look at their numbers offensively. They are they rank six. They have 166, 166 hard hit balls, uh, and that's the sixth most in Major League Baseball. Then you look at their run production, right? It, it's it's nowhere near the sixth in baseball, uh, and and that's where you look at this correlation where okay, does hitting the ball hard translate to runs? And I think over the long haul of a season. If you continually get hard contact like the Giants are doing, the offense is going to come around. And yesterday we were talking about what can possibly be done. I mean, we saw that Bob Melvin and this coaching staff was trying to mix in different ways to generate offense because the power wasn't necessarily there. I wouldn't say necessarily there. It wasn't there. It, they haven't hit a home run. Tyros Estrada's uh, home run in the fourth inning yesterday snapped a seven-game homerless uh, streak. For the, for the Giants. They hadn't hit one since April 3rd in Los Angeles. So they the power just hadn't been there. So the, the Giants, Bob Melvin, the coaching staff, they were trying to find ways to generate offense for this team. And they did it by Tyler Fitzgerald. They did it by Matt Chapman. They did it by guys stealing base. Jung-Hoo Lee got his first stolen base of, of the year uh, earlier this series. So... They, they were trying to figure things out. And, and something that is really, uh, I think it's a breath of fresh air in that, I mean, we're freaking out, right? We're like, ah, oh, they, can't, they can't do anything offensively. They can't do anything offensively. But over the long haul of a season, you have to have a manager that understands their team, that isn't only looking at the analytical approach, that understands that there needs to be cohesiveness in the Giants lineup. And when you continually throw out the same lineup and you don't get results, it can be frustrating. We, I think that that is a main reason why Bob Melvin, that, that's why he, he got fired up. He needed a way, an, another way, a find another way to fire up his team, right? F trying to find 
ways to generate offense by stealing bases. They're still not hitting. All right, I need to light a fire under their ass. Like, that's what Bob Melvin did in getting ejected. Uh, and and you just see that translate to the day after, right? He gets ejected. They they have conversations, right? And, and, and you look at where this offense went yesterday. It's just a matter of time for them to all put it together because Jorge Soler, by the way, Jorge Soler, any time that he connects, dude, any time that he connects, it's over 440 easily. Yesterday he hit a bomb, a tank. I still don't even know. I got to ask Joe Rizzo on the talkback. Has the ball come down? Like, has the ball even come down in, from L.A.? He hit that one 452. I mean, this guy, when he connects, uh, and that's why, I mean, a sneak peek for Diamond Notes, that's why he's an X factor of mine. Uh, when he can connect, if he is in the, the four hole, if he is batting cleanup, when he connects and we have guys on base, Giants have guys on base, that can that could be problematic for opposing pitchers. Uh, and Jorge Soler has actually been having a lot of solid contact, solid ABs. So it's really encouraging to see that he is coming around um, with the bat and just <laughs> every t- I love every time that he that he uh, connects with the ball, he just sends it into orbit. So I love that part of it as well. But you keep throwing these guys out there because. In an analytical approach, I mean, it's only 15 games in, right? And they are, uh, Raph, 6-9. and nine. Nice. Uh, <laughs> the, the Giants. What? Yeah, yeah, thank you. The Giants are 6-9 uh, are and nine on the year, but, you know, it's it's early in the season, and maybe in past years, in, in past uh, leadership, right, maybe they did give Solaire a day off. Maybe, maybe that would have been uh, something that happened in years past. But now that we have the manager and Bob Melvin trusting his guys, I think that that's huge for this offense. And now they have a little bit of confidence and now they now they know what they're capable of because this might be just scratching the surface. Not again, not saying that they can hit five home runs every single day, but the fact that they have as many hard hit balls that they do, six in the major leagues, uh the fact that Matt Chapman is is ranking amongst, you know, Everyone, Shohei Otani, uh, Juan Soto, like Jordan Alvarez, like he's ranking in the likes of those guys, him and Jung Hoo Lee, as far as hard hard hit ball rate. Uh, you figure at some point, and like we saw yesterday, the balls are going to find holes and the balls are going to get launched and get out of the ballpark. So how are you feeling about the Giants offense uh, so far? We got that explosion yesterday with... The five home runs, if you missed it, uh, we will play it later today uh, in, in the Giants' warm-up. Tyro Estrada had two. Lamont Wade hit his first home run of the year. Jorge Soler sends another ball into orbit. And Matt Chapman uh, got just got the, the cherry on top <laughs> with, with, the, with the catcher coming in. Uh, he said, hey, I wanted to join the party too. So Matt Chapman gets his. And we have three guys, uh, if, if, if I have that correctly. I don't have it in front of me, but I believe we have three guys that have three home runs, and that is Matt Chapman, uh, Conforto, and actually, no, it's four. Is it four guys? Tyro Estrada, Matt Chapman, Jorge Soler, and Conforto. So, so it's four guys with three home runs, and hopefully they can keep that going uh, as this series progresses because they're they're leaving today, and they have the chance to get their first road series win in Tampa Bay. Then they go to Miami. Miami has not been playing good ball, so they have an opportunity to really get these these bats going. And it was nice uh, that Jesus Lazardo w- will be missing the Giants as well when they go into Miami. So we will talk more about the Giants offense, Giants pitching staff. Blake Snell is pitching today, second start of his Giants career, returning to the trop, and he goes against the opener, uh, Sean Armstrong, who is a righty, and then maybe you'll see a lefty uh, thrown in there afterwards, and we'll have to see what what they do with Lamont Wade because that has been a story of of his um, his Giants tenure is that he can't li- hit lefties. He is one for one against lefties this year. I'm just just throwing that out there. He's bat he's batting a thousand against lefties, so maybe you keep keep him out there uh, when they bring the lefty in eventually. Uh, like to see what he could do because he is one of the hottest bats on the Giants offense, and it's nice to see that he was able to uh, to to scratch across a home run yesterday, a two-run bomb 
uh, to add to that five for the San Francisco Giants. So how are you feeling about the offense? How are you feeling about the uh, Giants pitching staff? We will talk more about that. But coming up next, we will be chatting with the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum to help us celebrate Jackie Robinson Day, which is tomorrow, April 15th. Uh, so we will have that conversation with you. We will talk with Bob Kendrick coming up next. You're listening to the Giants warm-up show on The Sports Leader.
Welcome back to the Giants warm-up show as the Giants and the Rays are set for the rubber match. Giants will try to get their first road win uh, or road series win of the season on the back of Blake Snell, who makes his return to the trot. But now we shift our attention to April 15th, 1947, the day that Jackie Robinson would change baseball and this country. Uh, and being that Jackie Robinson Day is tomorrow, I wanted to take time to acknowledge the man and the legend of Jackie Robinson. Joining me to talk about Jackie and his lasting impact is the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum, the great Bob Kendrick. Uh, on on Bob, first of all, thank, thank you for taking the time to join me on the show today. Uh, how are you doing today? Walter, man, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, man, I'm really excited to uh, to have this conversation with you. And and you know, I was actually playing the show uh, not too long ago, uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's my guy, that's my guy, Bob, man. So we'll talk, we'll we'll get into all of that. We'll get into all of that for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, Bob, man, uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, I, I kind of want to take a look back. I, I opened it up in saying that uh, the 77th anniversary of Jackie Robinson uh, breaking the color barrier in 1947 is, is approaching. And it feels like it was such a long time ago. And I feel like it's a great time to uh, talk about their Negro Leagues and, and everything that you're doing. But uh, let's kind of focus on Jackie a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of people that saw him play ball um, and uh, that are alive today. But when you think about Jackie Robinson and the significance of Jackie Robinson Day, what really comes to mind uh, for you as, as, we, as we celebrate Jackie? Well, it's twofold for us, particularly here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, because we're constantly reminding folks of something that many baseball fans seemingly do not know, and that is that Jackie's professional baseball roots began in the Negro Leagues, right here in Kansas City with the great Kansas City Monarchs. I do think that most of the people who come here think that Jackie just walked out of nowhere and started playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> yeah. But his real rookie season was here in Kansas City in 1945. And he only spent five months in Kansas City. And I remind folks that the five months that he spent in KC, he fell in love with everything Kansas City is famous for, barbecue <laughs> and jazz. Yeah, uh, and so, and I was very fortunate to know several of his 1945 teammates before they passed away. And the interesting thing about it is, if they were with us right now, they would all tell you that when Jackie joined the Kansas City Monarchs in 1945, there was absolutely no fanfare surrounding him. He was just another ball player trying to make the great Kansas City Monarch roster. But what they would also tell you is they knew he was different than they were. And my dear friend, the late great Buck O'Neill, would surmise it in this fashion. We had become acclimated to segregation, but not Jackie. You got to remember, Jackie is Pasadena, California. He is UCLA. <laughs> this old Jim Crow thing didn't sit well with him whatsoever. But besides that, that was it. And five months later, man, he was gone. He had literally disappeared. His teammates didn't know where he was. And, of course, we now know he was meeting with Branch Rickey where the two of them would make the monumental decision that he would become the chosen one to break Major League Baseball's six-decade-long self-imposed color barrier. And, of course, here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, we make the rather bold assertion that Jackie Robinson's breaking of the color barrier wasn't just a part of the civil rights movement. It was actually the beginning mm -hmm. of the civil rights movement in this country. This is 1947. This is well before those more noted civil rights occurrences. So this is before Brown versus the Board of Education. This is before Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of the bus. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as my friend Buck O'Neill would so eloquently say, was merely a sophomore at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, when Jackie signed his contract to play in the Dodgers organization. And as I remind people, our very own President Harry S. Truman, born right up the road from where the museum operates, Independence, Missouri, would not integrate the armed forces until a year 
after Jackie. So for all intents and purposes, this is what indeed started the ball of social progress rolling in our country. So his story is far more than just a baseball story. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most profound stories and rightfully celebrated the way that it is. And we need to continue to do that. Well, and, and, and I love uh, that Jackie Robinson Day comes around every year. And, and obviously, we need to have these conversations more. Uh, it doesn't have to be just just around April 15th, right? But what, what I love about it, Bob, is that every single year you have these conversations and there's a new anecdote. There's a new story that comes mm-hmm. out about Jackie. And that's just what I love about it. I mean, uh, you talking about all, all his players uh, with the Kansas City Monarchs pretty much saying that he was cut from a different cloth. I mean, he was different. So I kind of want to follow that up with you, you had all the all this amazing talent playing in the Negro Leagues uh, at that time. What really made Jackie stand out? Because, I mean, if you look back, Willie Mays, he got his start a year after uh, it, with with, um, with the Bir- Birmingham uh, Black Birmingham Barons, Black Bear. yeah, he Absolutely. got his year after uh, the year after that Jackie broke into Major League Baseball. That's where Willie came up. He was 17 years old. He was a young kid. He could have been yeah, that was- guy. So what really separated Jackie and, and really w- it, he was just the perfect person to uh, to put into the situation and bring about change in the in the country. Jackie had what I call the intangibles that better prepared him to deal with the immense racial hatred that he was going to be confronted with. Now, interesting enough for my Giant fans, Jackie wasn't the first choice. Jackie was not Branch Rickey's first choice. Mm -hmm. Branch Rickey's first choice was the great Monty Irvin. Mm -hmm. Uh Monty (laughs) Irvin, for you Giant fans, and particularly the young Giant fans, may not know the name, but you should. Monty Irvin was a superstar player in the Negro Leagues, five-two kind of player with movie star good looks. He had everything you needed to be a star, but Monty had just gotten back from World War II. Yeah. And Monty admittedly was suffering from what he then called shell shock. Today, of course, we would call it PTSD. Mm-hmm. But the real reason that Monty wasn't the first was because of Effa Manley, who owned the Newark Eagles, where Monty played. She blocked Monty from being the first because she threatened to litigate against Branch Rickey because Branch Rickey didn't want to pay for the talent. Branch wanted to come in and take this talent out the Negro Leagues without any compensation, and that's when he turns his sight over to Kansas City to Jackie Robinson. And here's how shrewd Rickey was. Rickey never paid as my mother would say, not one red cent for Jackie Robinson. He didn't sign Jackie. He took Jackie away from the Negro Leagues. And and Ricky knew that the Kansas City Monarchs, or at least in my estimation, Ricky knew that the Kansas City Monarchs owner couldn't fight back. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because he was white. Mm -hmm. James Leslie Wilkinson was a white man who made his entire living in black baseball. Well, he can't be the person that stands up and blocks what every black person in America had been waiting on. If he did, that fan base would have turned their backs on him right away. And i got to believe that Ricky knew this. Uh huh. And so Wilkie basically relented. Now, again, back to your question. I'm a sidestep your question. I'm going off into a whole other tangent. <laughs> <laughs> All good stuff, man. All good stuff. But the reason that Jackie was the right choice And that's not to say that there weren't others who could have done it, because I have no doubt that Monty Irvin could have done it, Mm -hmm. because he had the same pedigree that Jackie, those same intangibles. See, Jackie was college educated. He had already been an All-American football player at UCLA. So there was a little bit of cachet surrounding him. He was disciplined. He had served in the military. And, of course, he would become stable. He was stable because he would become married to the beautiful Rachel Robinson. Mm -hmm. And I do believe all those intangibles were necessary to deal with this racial hatred that he was going to be confronted with. As I remind my guests all the time, when Jackie Robinson walked out on that field April 15, 1947, he was called everything but, as my mother would say, but a child of God Mm -hmm. when he walked out there. 
and, and they knocked him down continuously. They did everything to try and deter, you know deter him from this, and Jackie would not break. But you then you think about the other side of the ledger, and this is a side that is oftentimes overlooked because we focus on the racial hatred, and it was insurmountable. It was real. But then again, Jackie is also carrying 21 million black folks Mm -hmm. on his back when he walked across those lines. Because if he fails, an entire race of people would have failed. And, and man, can you imagine the, the weight that this man was shouldering? And somehow or another, he was able to push that all aside, walk out on that field, and play this game at an extraordinarily high level, carrying that kind of weight. We are talking about a game that is predicated on failure. You know this. Baseball at its crux is a game of failure. And he cannot fail because if he fails, we don't know if another black man would have been given an opportunity Mm -hmm. because it would have fit the narrative of what the other owners already had embedded in their minds and hearts is that these black players weren't good enough to play in the major leagues. And they knew better. They knew these guys could play. Yeah, and it's an incredible story. Uh, Bob Kendrick's talking with us, uh, president of the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, here on the Sports Leader. And and yeah, I mean that that weight that Jackie Robinson had to carry. It wasn't only from the start of 1947. It was all the way through the end of 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 his life, right? But but that burden that that he did carry. I mean, it did bring us the likes of Willie Mays. It did bring us the likes of Hank. Aaron. Aaron and and uh, and Bob Gibson and Willie Willie McCovey, right? If you're looking back on on all the greatness that that has stemmed from Jackie breaking the color barrier in 1947, I mean, you can even co- look at at more of the modern era of of, uh, of baseball, where you look at Tony Gwynn, Barry Larkin, uh, Ricky Henderson, Barry Bonds out here in the Bay Area. So, I mean, you look at everything that that has come afterwards that that baseball has allowed uh following Jackie Robinson but what one thing that I kind of want to touch on Bob is, is when we're when we're talking about the state of baseball right now and uh you know every Jackie Robinson day people uh w- would would say that you know you look around the, le- the the game today and it isn't the type of game that Jackie would necessarily be happy with seeing and that the the numbers for for black athletes in baseball just just isn't there as it was in its heyday. So uh, I'm just trying to see, like, what what do you think? What is and, and what can be done for MLB to start having black greatness back on the diamond? Well, the thing that I'm excited about are the measures that both Major League Baseball and the Players Association are implementing to try and reverse this alarming trend. We understand that it's a problem. And uh, I love the fact that we are all collectively working on a solution. And I do think that these programs that are being implemented are starting to pay dividends. Mm -hmm. Because what we're starting to see now is the minor leagues a little bit more populated with black players as black players are now getting. And we speak of American-born black players Mm -hmm. who are getting drafted into these various major league farm systems. And you can start to slowly project when this pendulum will likely shift. And so, number one, we had to do some things to bridge the economic divide that is hindering our game, that has literally priced out a lot of kids from playing our game. You know, our game went from a blue-collar game to essentially a country club kind of game because it is a Mm pay-to-play kind of game. It is so totally different than when I was a kid and we were playing on the sandlot and you didn't even have to have nine kids on your team. You know, whatever the number was, you divided them up, yes. and then you made up the rules to go right along with it. So if you hit the ball in Miss Jones' yard, you were out. So you learned how to hit the other way and these kinds of things. And, and But those days, are, it saddens me to say it, but yeah. those days of Sandlot baseball are a thing of the past. So when this game became organized, everything about it, became expensive, you know, from the equipment to the league fees to the specialization now having 
having hitting coaches and batting coaches at such an early age if you're going to compete at that level and all the specialization that comes along with it, and it just simply priced a lot of kids out of this game. Now, we've got to do some other things, and I think baseball is working on that too, to bring that level of cool back to the game. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That people say, hey, wait a minute, this is something that I can get to. The pace of the game is maybe faster than what it used to be, and some of the rule changes has helped implement that. But as you referenced when we started the conversation, the video game. Oh, yeah. This introduction of the Negro Leagues in the video game mm-hmm. is going to really, I think, draw a lot more kids of color to wait a minute, let's look at baseball because we played this game and we played it as well as anyone ever played this game. And you touched on something a minute ago when you talked about the players that we could have potentially missed. If Jackie doesn't break the color barrier in 1947, and it's 10 years or 20 years later, we would have missed Willie Mays. Mm-hmm. We would have missed Henry Aaron. We would have missed Ernie Banks. We would have missed Roberto Clemente mm-hmm. and Bob Gibson. And the list goes on and on. And can you imagine our sport without those great stars? It's, you can't even imagine it. But if you could imagine what it was like before 1947, because as I remind people all the time, Man, they didn't learn how to play after 1947. They were playing great baseball well before 1947. And so we missed some of the greatest talent to ever play this game because of the backward nature of our society where skin color was dictating everything that was going on. And so to see baseball now also embrace this museum and understanding that the history does play a tremendous role in helping shape and motivate kids because they see themselves, and they see themselves in their full glory. And we do think that this can have an impact. And so the partnership that the museum has with Major League Baseball and Players Association is significant, and it's part of the solution to try and get that pendulum to shift the other way. And I think we will. I think we'll see more American-born blacks playing this game at the Major League level. Now, of course, this requires, and I'm going to say this because I already know that we are not this patient <laughs> <laughs> no well said well said bob kendrick from uh from the the negro league museum president of the negro league museum in kansas city missouri and and you kind of brought up something that uh that i do want to want to get into i got to get the experience of you doing uh the 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 show the video game but <laughs> but before that you you brought up roberto clemente right and and where yeah. i i am i am latino and and, and i love to see guys that that resemble me right and and a of part course. a part of my my fabric was uh Roberto Clemente being a hero of mine right I mean he was out there and and playing great ball and all that kind of stuff you see all that but then you know the history of of what he did off the field and what he meant to uh to the people of Puerto Rico and just everyone that that he was able to get his hands on so that was a, a huge part of the fabric so you bring that up in that we don't get Willie Mays we don't get Hen- Henry Aaron we don't get Roberto Clemente and it's like that's that's a huge part of the fabric of who I am as a human being in, in that the teachings of of him being a humanitarian and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's just completely different um, as far as, you know, what could have happened. Like, I don't even want to oh, think yeah. about that, Bob. I don't even want to think about that. No, 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 absolutely. <laughs> so we're thankful that Jackie breaks color barrier yeah. when he does because Willie Mays is arguably the greatest major leaguer of all time. Oh, without There's a doubt. no question yeah. that he's the greatest living major leaguer right. and maybe the greatest major leaguer of all time. Mm-hmm. We just celebrated a couple of days ago the great Henry Aaron, the 50th anniversary mm-hmm. yeah. of him breaking Babe Ruth's record. This was a skinny, cross-handed hitting <laughs> shortstop yeah. from Mobile, Alabama, mm-hmm. who joined the Indianapolis Clowns in 1952. <laughs> So now you're talking two of baseball's greatest players who come out of the Negro Leagues. And and you brought a big smile to my face when you started talking about Roberto Clemente. Because do you know who Roberto Clemente idolized? Uh, Willie Mays, right? He idolized the great Monty Irvin. Oh, Monty Irvin, okay. (laughs) Roberto Clemente wanted to be Monty Irvin. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Monty Irvin was there in Puerto Rico putting on a show. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a and Roberto Clemente Jr. told me this. He says that his father idolized Monty Irvin and that he used to carry Monty Irvin's uniform to the ballpark. Oh. And if you carried the player's uniform to the ballpark, mm-hmm. he let you in the game for free. And that Monty Irvin gave his dad his first real baseball glove. Uh huh. Wow. And, and that's what I tell people all the time. Roberto Clemente is a hero to so many. Right. But every hero has a hero. Yeah. And for young Roberto Clemente, it was the great Monty Irvin. And when Roberto Clemente tragically dies mm-hmm. in that plane accident, delivering supplies to Nicaragua after the horrific earthquake. Mm-hmm. You may recall they waived the five-year rule for yeah. him to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah, he, 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 he was inducted like the, the next uh, next year, wasn't he? Or like months yeah, after that. Yeah. yeah. Who does he go into the Hall of Fame with? Yeah. Monty Irvin. The only baseball man. Yeah. Only in baseball do you get yeah. these kinds of stories. And I'm a fan of all the sports, yeah. but they don't move you like baseball. And even as I think about the epic game that is being planned for June 20th oh, yeah. there in Alabama, yep. in Birmingham, Alabama, at Rickwood Field, it gives me chills just to think about the possibilities of Willie Mays being on that field one more time. Mm-hmm. Yes, some 70-plus years, y'all, after he walked out there as a 17-year-old center fielder for the Birmingham Black Barons. Can you imagine what that moment in time would be like? And again, only baseball creates these kinds of moments. I was at Fenway Park when they had the All-Star Game, and they brought Ted Williams out, and all the players from both you know, both sides, AL, NL, go out and they're surrounding the great Ted Williams. And, man, if that didn't give you goosebumps, then you were probably dead. You know, in that <laughs> that's I got I got chills right now. I got chills right now, Bob. I'm telling you, man. I got chills. This is great. That's the, same, yeah. that's the same thing if we're blessed and that he's able to be there. You can guarantee that the feeling that you will feel at Rickwood Field, which is a majestic, you know, hollow grounds to begin with, and and one of the few remaining ballparks that played home to the Negro Leagues. Bob Kendrick, I really appreciate you taking the time. And, yeah, June 20th, uh, that'll be the special day where uh, Willie Mays hopefully can make the return uh, to Rick Woodfield where he played formerly for the Birmingham Black Barons. Uh, Last time he was there or or on the field, I guess, as a player was when he was 17 years old. He turns 93 this year, Bob. So uh, I'm I'm really excited. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to have had you on and have this conversation. I'm pretty sure we'll talk more down the line and and as june uh, 20th approaches we'll probably have another conversation bob i really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me today oh man it's my pleasure thanks so much for having me the great bob kendrick president of the negro league museum baseball museum in kansas city missouri and i just peel back the curtain a little bit me, me and bob we we could have been we could have kept talking for like another two hours. <laughs> we we talked after we ended that, and uh, and he was just so jacked up. He said he he was just getting started. So uh, I just want to thank Bob for stopping by the podcast and and having that interview with me and and uh, being able to to share it with all of you. So if you missed any of that, please check out uh, the podcast on the KMBR podcast page. As I had him on the Rounding Third and King podcast. Uh, which is hosted by yours truly. What an incredible conversation with Bob. Uh, still riding from the high from that conversation. I can't thank him enough for taking the time to join me on the show. So coming up next, we will dive back into the Giants and the Rays. The Giants try to win their first road series of the season. Blake Snell is on the mound, and uh, and it gets you thinking. Once this rotation gets going and the offense can uh, finally keep it going, This Giants team can be a really fun one to watch in 2024. So more coming up on the Giants warm-up show on The Sports Leader.
Next pitch, Estrada swings, belts one, deep left. It's on its way, it is gone. Tyro Estrada, a two-out solo home run here in the fourth. It gives the Giants back the lead, it's two to one. And the home run streak is over. Got a lot of room on the left side of the infield. The pitch, Wade swings, drives a high fly ball, deep right center, Palacios back onto the warning track. He leaps, it is gone! Lamont Wade Jr. A two out, two run home run. Watching one out to right center. The Giants second home run in his many innings. Giants next opponent, the Marlins. They're hosting the Braves this weekend. As Soler swings, there's a high deep drive on its way to deep center, way back and gone. Third home run of the game for the Giants. Jorge Soler challenges one of the deepest parts of this ballpark. All right. Welcome back to the Giants warm-up show as we get you ready for the pregame show uh, starting in about under 10 minutes and first pitch 11 o'clock for the Giants. We had to do that package for you. If you are listening uh, on the stream, you missed the song. Gap Band dropped a bomb on me. We just we got to play that song every single time. That's the main reason why I wanted why I wanted the package draft is, is that I, I needed to hear that song uh, before we got everything going. But the Giants' offense is is starting to click, and it's great to see. And all those home runs we played three of them there had five yesterday. So let's go ahead and give you the lineup really quick uh, before we get out for Giants pregame show at eleven o'clock or ten o'clock rather. Uh, the Giants lineup looks. Much of the same, but let's uh, let's go through it. Leading off is Jung Hoo Lee in center field, batting second is Wilmer Flores at first base, batting third Lamont Wade Jr. at uh, right in right field. You have Jorge Soler batting cleanup at DH. Got Chapman batting fifth at third base. You have Michael Conforto batting sixth in left field. Tyro Estrada batting seventh now, not sixth. He's batting seventh, uh, second base, and you have Tom Murphy batting eighth. At uh, catcher, and then you have Tyler Fitzgerald batting ninth, giving Nick Ahmed a day off. Really quick before we get out of here, wrapping up the Giants warm-up show, let's give you the standings update sponsored by the Alameda County Probation Department. Visit joinacpd.org today for a career that matters. Now the Giants uh, get that win yesterday, and that puts them at 6-9. and nine. Nice. They are still fourth in the NL West Dodgers are still comfortable at the top. They won yesterday against the Padres, eleven and six. Padres eight and nine, one game below five hundred. Diamondbacks seven and eight, uh, one game below five hundred as well. Giants six and nine, and the Rockies four and one. And that is your standings update brought to you by Alameda County Probation Department. Giants warm up is concluded. Giants pregame coming up. Giants Rays on the Sports Leader.